Roll call. Council Barton? Present. Present. Council Cahill? Present. Present. Council Capano? Present. Present. Council Chicoutis? Present. Present. Council Colucci? Present. Present. Council Sear? Present. Present. Council LaPierre? Present. Present. Council Losey? Present. Present. Council Nett? Present. Present. Council Jahant? Present. Present. Council Walsh? Present. Present. I'll rise for a moment of silence. Keep in mind the family of Helen Durgan, Mr. President. Thank you, Council LaPierre. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I can see most of us didn't get the menu, uh, memo today, blues the color. Um, not only one council is actually wearing blue, so good job. Thank you. There's going to be some. Uh... Mm -hmm. Before we get started on the public hearing on the trash, um, what we're going to do is we're going to allot everyone to speak that wants to come up and speak two minutes. We're going to start out with the mayor. Um, He's going to be the first speaker, and the first group of people that get up will be uh, in favor. The second group will be in opposition. And what I'm going to do is we're going to allow the mayor to speak and the sheriff, who I just want to actually point out, we have in our audience tonight the newly elected sheriff, Kevin Coppinger, who is from Lynn. And then we'll go on to the chiefs and the superintendent and some of the other department heads, as well as some of the union presidents. And then we'll allow anybody else who wants to speak to get up and speak. So let's open the public hearing. The public hearing is a proposed ordinance amending the ordinance establishing regulations relative to the storage, disposal, and maintenance of residential and commercial refuse containers and properties within the city of Lynn. Mayor Kennedy. All those wishing to speak in favor? I know I don't have to introduce or ask her name, but for public record. I'm going to do it anyway. Thank you, um, Mayor. Judy Kennedy, 23 Buchanan Circle. Thank you. Two minutes isn't a long time, so I'll just try to give you a synopsis, but I will be available to answer any questions anybody might have. With uh, the school departments, budget mandatory increasing from $107 million in FY210, 2010, the year I took office, to this year being $143,983,000, which is an increase of about 30, uh, $32, 33000000 million over a seven-year period. Uh, and the school population going from 13625 to over 16,000 this year in our schools, a 20, almost about a 20% increase. The city budget year after year has been strained trying to keep the mandatory school funding at the required level while at the same time keeping the services on the city side at the required level. For the last seven years, we've been able to do that without any layoffs and without any substantial changes in fees. This year, we weren't able to do that. The, the deficit that we were trying to, the hole in the budget that we were trying to close was simply too big. Over the last 10 weeks, Council President Sear and Council Vice, Council Vice President Barton, our Chief Financial Officer, our Comptroller, our Attorney, um, everybody has been meeting in my office every Tuesday trying to find ways to close that hole. When we get to talking about the budget, I'll go into greater detail about the other things that we've done. However, consistently I have said, the two objectives I have in forming this budget are one, to have as minimal impact 
on the average taxpayer in the city of Lynn as possible, and two, to retain as many of our employees as possible. We considered a number of different things, and these again will be part of the budget discussion later on. But the only item that we considered that could get us a substantial amount of money with one action was a tax fee, tax trash fee. And I apologize, I'm sick. Um, again, thinking along the lines of hurting the average single family homeowner or average resident as little as possible. The council president, vice president, and I devised a three-tiered program for trash fees. People who are operating businesses or operating um, nonprofits in the city are going to be paying the most, which is about $40 a month, a little over $40 a month. Out-of-town landlords are going to be paying a middle level. And people who own, for example, a two-family residence and they live on one floor, will have to pay for the units in which they do not live. Their level that we were discussing is $150, which is about $12 a month. And the, the unit that is occupied by the Lynn resident would not be paying anything. So we believe this is fair. We believe that with this trash fee, it will be the one last piece of the puzzle that will allow us to retain our employees and we believe that it hurts the city of Lynn residents, those who just go about their business and live here in Lynn, the least of all the options, uh, the least dislikable of all the options that we studied over the 10 weeks that we put together this budget. I will be available for any questions after the public hearing. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor. Sheriff. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, thank you for hosting this public hearing. Kevin Carpenter, 37 Martin Road here in Lynn, as you heard, Sheriff and former Police Chief for many, many years. Um, I come here this evening, most importantly, as a homeowner and a taxpayer for this community. I understand I've been following this thing since I left the City of Lynn's employee back in January or the financial hardships. But it's something I'm very familiar with over the last several years. As you folks on the council know and the mayor knows, the police department budget's been trimmed substantially over the last three years to the point that when I was in that office, I had to shut down several special units to put officers in, in patrol vehicles to answer the calls. And I'm not here to speak uh, uh, for Chief McGarry. I know he's in the back. I'm sure he'll have his say, and I'll yield to him on the police department things. But I do want to say, frankly, and just to cut to the chase, my concerns are layoffs. I don't know how you're going to maintain the city of Lynn without adequate numbers of public safety personnel, and I'm particularly going to talk about the police officers. You know, I can go back 33 years, 1985, when I got on this department as a young patrolman. It was five years since Proposition 2 and a half was passed. The city hadn't hired any cops. I got on here. It was fun. It was fun being a rookie cop. You could go out and make all the arrests you wanted to in a night. It was chaos. You could grab four or five felonies a night. That's what young cops want to do. They want to change the world. But frankly speaking, maturity weighs in. It was nuts. Crime rate was, was high. The problems were out there. You talk, I know you only have six cruisers on the street now. Those days we went out sometimes with four, whatever showed up at roll call. And that's what scares me if you do layoffs. You're going to have those numbers going out in a city of this size, 90,000 population. That's not right. And crime is different today. There's more guns on the street and there's gangs. And I applaud the men and women of the Lynn Police Department behind me here. They've done a tremendous job over the years. You know, I would never expected to come back to another budget hearing, but I'm here tonight because, as you guys and ladies know, crime has dropped substantially over the last few years. You have less cops now than I've seen in many, many years, and if you lay off, you're going to have even worse. Crime's going to go back up. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes time, but it will happen. And the more reductions you do, the worse it's going to get. But before closing, I want to touch on one other topic, and that's economic development. I've been saying this for a number of years, and I've said it to a lot of you. I'm going to repeat it again. I read the papers. We're looking at development on the Linway, out downtown, the Lynn Arts District. We're trying to bring new blood in here, which is a new tax base. People will not come to the city of Lynn unless they feel safe. You can try to get everybody in you want, all the developers, 
but I've worked for the city for 33 years, and I've seen the cause and effect of crime. Trust me, they will not come unless you can, they feel safe, or their residents or their buyers feel safe in this community. We're going in the wrong direction. So I implore you, please, give this serious consideration. This is an important topic. You must maintain public safety. Or God forbid, I don't know where this, this city is going, but I wish you luck. It's a tough decision, but please, you give it your best judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, police Chief. Good evening. I understand this is a complex issue, but my concern is the ramifications for the Lynn Police Department. Uh, currently, July 1st, we have a $2.5 million deficit and will be 26 officers short in our department. This is the fourth hearing I've come to in regards to budgets. And every year we're talking about how the police department is absorbing cuts and how we have reduced manpower. It's distressing that I have to come here and advocate for a vote to ensure that we don't have layoffs. What we should be discussing is how quickly we can reinforce our department with manpower. Our officers are doing an exceptional job here under very difficult circumstances. They are stretched thin, trust me when I say that, and they need additional support. I've been told by both the council president and the mayor directly that if this vote is not approved, that we would lose 12 officers initially and another 12 officers in December. Coupled with the 26 that we have missing now, that's over 50 officers in the department, effectively one third of the police department will be eliminated. I don't know how you can do that. Cops who are laid off will be put on a layoff list, but I can assure you they will be hired by some other department and they won't be coming back here. We'll never recover from this. I believe there'll be a striking decline in police services, an elimination of all preventive patrols and services. We'll eliminate the SRO program. Not only is this a public safety issue, but it will become an officer safety issue. The key to a vibrant city, as the sheriff eloquently stated, is public safety. The key to economic development is for people to feel safe and provide effective public safety services to the community. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Chief. Fire Chief. Good evening, Councillors, and thank you for the opportunity. The fire department may not be losing personnel, but it, the, the effects of this uh, a negative decision on this topic is going to affect the apparatus we're driving, the firehouses we're, we're working out of, the equipment we use. All of it is starting to fail rapidly. And I've never stood here before and asked for anything for me personally, and I'm not going to ask for anything for my employees, my firefighters personally. I represent nine, over 90,000 people in this city as a public service provider. My worry is us being able to take care of the people we were hired to take care of. That is not going to happen if, these cuts go, if this cut goes through or this fee does not prevail. I implore the councillors that they must vote for this. It keeps, it's going to keep us in a position where we can continue to do our job at the low level that we're doing it now. Um, I've been through layoffs. I can re reiterate with the police officers uh, twice in, on the fire department in my career, and we still haven't recovered. So when Chief McGarry says it'll be a long time to recover, he's absolutely correct. So I implore you to vote in favor of the trash fee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief. I'm going to ask the superintendent of schools, Kathy Latham, to come up. Good evening, Catherine Latham, 46 Magnolia Avenue. I'm the superintendent. Um, thank you very much for listening tonight. Since 2009, when I became the superintendent, enrollment in the Lynn Public Schools has increased by over 2,600 students. 
This is a huge increase and, as you know, has put a severe strain on our buildings and our resources. Thankfully, educational support from the state has increased based on the increase in enrollment. From 2010 to 2017, Chapter 70 funding has experienced, as the mayor mentioned, a $36 million increase. However, that money is not without a cost. That cost to us in the city is about 25%. Um, if the state gives us approximately $75 million, the city has to say thank you to the tune of $25 million. So if the state gives us $150 million to operate the school, the city's required uh, share is $50 million. So as the Chapter 70 allotment goes up, the city share goes up, and that's the required district contribution. And over from 2010 to 2017, the, require, the share has gone up $36 million, making the city's contribution between eight and nine million dollars more. <clears throat> With very large numbers of children come many family members. The increased population in the city requires additional supports, obviously from the fire department, the EMTs, the police department, DPW, ISD support, road maintenance, it all takes its toll. These resources need to be increased. Well, the state also gives the city money through unrestricted local aid. That's supposed to help with public safety and the increases that we are experiencing. However, our unrestricted local aid for the city during the same period from 2010 to 2017 has gone up a mere 1.8 million. So eight or nine million to meet the uh, Chapter 70 requirement and only 1.8 to meet the additional um, burden that more and more people in the city bring with them. Even raising taxes to the maximum possible through Proposition 2.5 is probably not enough to overcome the need. I know that voting for this fee is difficult. However, with respect to the data, just the numbers alone, the system has put you and the whole city in a difficult pos position. In fact, it's not unlike the lower income cities in the state who have experienced similar increases. It's certainly not your fault, but it is a problem with which you must courageously deal. I don't envy you the responsibility, but I think that your responsibility is to support the services for all of its citizens in the city. Um, we have wonderful people here, wonderful children, and um, I would urge you to support this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Latham. I'm going to ask our CFO and city solicitor, I mean, uh, Assessor Peter Karen, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Peter Karen, uh, Director of Assessing and also Chief Financial Officer. I live at uh, 150 Linway in Lynn. Uh, I'm, I'll speak both as the CFO and as an individual department head to discuss the, uh, the issue. Uh, I took over as CFO in uh, midnight 2013 and uh, since then it's been a constant struggle to follow up on uh, Dr. Latham's comments, it's been a constant struggle to try to find enough money to maintain the schools when ha and minimize the impact on uh, the city side of the budget. Uh, frankly, there's a limited amount of revenue and under state law, we're required to give, uh, the, basically the school department has priority on that revenue. Without increasing revenues or making cuts, there's no w other way to balance this budget. As far as cuts have happened, uh, we've been made substantial cuts to the non-personnel si non side of the budget over the last four years. Uh, as, you, as all the councils can attest, they haven't been able to find much fat in those line items uh, as each budget season has come and gone. So uh, 
you know, I, I work at, with, with the council president and the mayor to try to craft this budget. It was clear that we simply don't have the revenue to maintain the status quo at this point without either coming up with revenue or making cuts that are simply would imperil uh, the city's ability to provide services, not only in public safety, but in all forms of uh, uh, city operations, whether it be uh, inspectors or uh, other, other uh, components of the city operations. Uh, I also want to speak as an individual department has director of assessing uh, you know w w my staff over since I've been here has been reduced by about 35 percent 30 percent over that time uh, I could you know I've gone from 11 people down to eight people uh, we've had to uh, you know make do with what we had we work very different with, we work very hard to produce fair and equitable assessments for all the taxpayers in the city to make sure that they are treated fairly and pay o only their fair share of the city's tax burden. Uh, I could easily see uh, without this ordinance passing a minimum one person and possibly two people out of my department, which is another 25% reduction over my current staffing level, which we we simply won't be able to provide the quality of uh, assessments that we've had in the past. So I would urge the counselors in order to maintain uh, the highest possible level of services that we can to uh, pass this ordinance in order to bring some desperately needed revenue into the city in order to maintain our service levels. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. At this point, I'm going to ask if there are any department heads who would like to come up and uh, sure. I'm going, to, I'm going to allow the uh, city clerk to speak for us. Good evening. As you know, I'm Janet Rowe. I'm the city clerk and the chief of elections. In prior years, our office has submitted level funded budgets. For fiscal year 18, we were asked to submit a reduced budget to cover the cost of citywide pay raises. In response to the directive, I was able to reduce our budget through the following measures. We increased the fees, making ours comparable to other cities and towns, and we are still lower um, than all of them. We implement, implemented office supply saving measures. For instance, we've been making our own stationery. We created our own templates for both licenses and certificates. Uh, we even use both sides of the paper. Anything to save money. We have also experienced staff turnovers, which resulted in very large savings in payroll, longevity, and buyback. The only way to further reduce our budget beyond the extensive measures already taken is to lay off employees. A layoff in the city clerk side can only result in reduced services to the many citizens and businesses of Lynn. Uh, we produce over 4,000 birth, death, and marriage certificates annually. The state files office dictates time constraints on all of these. The, a reduction in staff here could jeopardize the timely issuance and result in non-compliance with state law. Our office also serves the businesses of Lynn with over 3,000 licenses and permits issued annually. Many de businesses depend on the city's clerk's office to operate. The car dealers need their licenses to get to the auctions, and the restaurants and bar owners need their liquor licenses to purge alcohol. It is currently our practice to get these licenses out right after the city council has approved them. Without appropriate staff, these licenses could be significantly delayed. A layoff in the election office could compromise our compliance with state, federal election, and census laws, as they are very specific in their time restrictions for each of these. This office has seen a significant increase in activity due to special elections and early voting. Additionally, in this upcoming election, we had 46 candidates take out papers to be on the ballot. In my 15 years, I have not seen this many people take out nomination papers. Without the appropriate staff, elections cannot run. I believe our office is the first link to the citizens of Lynn. 
At one time or another, everyone needs to come to our office. You're born, you register to vote, you run for office, you marry, you have kids, and then you die. We are an essential part of your life. Yes, we are. Our office employees are homeowners, taxpayers, and constituents. And we work very hard to meet the needs of the city. I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> On behalf of my office, I respectfully ask the council to please pass this trash ordinance to avoid any layoffs. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Do any other department heads wish to get up and speak in favor? Good evening, I'm Teresa Hurley, the Chief Librarian for the Lynn Public Library. A um, couple of things I just wanted to mention is um, if the library is significantly cut, uh, we lose our certification. And loss of certification means that we will lose our state aid, which we rely heavily on. Um, we will not be able to apply for any state grants. And uh, Lynn residents will lose their ability to borrow from other neighboring libraries. So they can only use our library and no other libraries. <clears throat> I'd also want to speak on the fact that <clears throat> being the director of a public building that's open 64 hours a week, six days a week, we have our fair share of incidents where we have to call the police. And they show up all the time. They're professional and they help us out. I feel like if there's a reduction in the police force, the response time will be longer. And it could jeopardize my staff and the public that comes to the library as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hold off for one second. Okay, continue, Andy. Hi, I'm Andrew Hall. I'm the Commissioner of Public Works, um, and I'm here to speak in favor of the ordinance in front of you. Um, I'm here representing the 46 full-time employees down at the DPW, and um, if this doesn't pass, then five of them are going to be laid off. 10% um, of our workforce is going to be sent home, so I strongly urge you to vote in favor of the tra trash ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Andy's the head of the DPW. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Mike Donovan, who is the head of ISD. Good evening, Council. It's Mike Donovan, 58 Stout Road, Chief of Inspectional Services and Building Commissioner. I respectfully urge you to give careful consideration to this uh, trash fee, um, as the failure to pass this trash fee will have a dramatic impact upon the Inspectional Services Department. Uh, we've gone in recent years from 32 people to approximately 24. This will cause a reduction of between four and five more people. Um, what that will mean is a delay in services to people who wish to put money into the city. Inspections will not be done in a timely fashion. Um, buildings will not be able to be opened in a timely fashion. Restaurants will not be opened or inspected when they need to be. So public health and Frankly, economic development will be impacted. So thank you for your time, and I respectfully request your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Anyone else? Clyde? Good evening, Councillors. Uh, Clint Mookie. I live at 169 Lynn Shore Drive. I'm the uh, Deputy Building Commissioner in the Inspectional Services Department. Um, I, I'm speaking separately, but, but largely piggybacking on the comments made by by both our former chief of police, the, the sheriff, as well as Chief McGarry and, and Commissioner Donovan. Um, I, I think the, the single most important factor that, that, that I would, would ask that you to keep in mind is what's been highlighted by each of them. Um, if, if the city were to experience layoffs and, inc and, and see a, a reduction in services, both public safety services, Permit, the ability to, to get permits, to get inspections, I, I think that it's unavoidable that whatever progress has been made in terms of economic development is, is going to be completely lost. And I think that they, there have been a, a, a variety of times in the past where, where it has looked like 
like things were, were going to turn for Lynn and, and development was coming through and I think we're in another one of those periods right now. Uh, just the number of projects that have come before the site plan review committee, um, the project on the Beacon Chevrolet site, the project on the former Gearworks site, um, you know, various other developments that are in the pipeline. And uh, if, if this were not, uh, if, if this amendment or, or this ordinance were not to be passed and, and we were to see a reduction in services, I, I think that all of that progress would be lost and, and, and obviously you've, you've heard the figures from, from the various other department heads about you know, exactly what would be lost but as, as a resident and, and as a citizen and as, and as somebody who isn't from Lynn, I, I, I choose to come to Lynn and I, I choose to remain and live in Lynn because I, I want to see um, progress and, and development in Lynn, um, I, I would ask you respectfully to adopt the ordinance. Thank you, Clint. Before we go any further, um, I know I see a lot of department heads. If you don't wish to get up and speak, you can just, at this point, raise your hand and say you're in favor of the uh, trash ones. I am going to ask the unions to get up. I see some union guys putting their hands up, but um, you can just make a note that a lot of people raise their hand. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, William Sharp, President of the Lynn Police uh, Association. Uh, I rise uh, just to make a few comments uh, in, in terms of representing uh, the people I represent. Uh, they're some of the hardest working uh, city employees, and it's my priv uh, privilege to represent them. <clears throat> and many of you may or may not know uh, I'm a lieutenant, but primarily the membership is uh, consisting of patrolmen and they do a job that is far harder than I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things I want to point out is in the five years of my tenure, one of the problematic issues that has arisen in our department uh, relate to officer injuries, uh, demands of service from our officers, as well as we've unfortunately seen some officers have to retire due to physical and psychological injuries. These are problems that I think will be enhanced or become even worse uh, should we see layoffs in the department. And I appreciate that each one of you is in a difficult situation, but we, uh, my membership would uh, sincerely appreciate your consideration uh, for supporting the department at this uh, critical time. Thank you. Thank you. Would any other union uh, officials or presidents Hello, my name is Lorraine Roser. I am the local 193 president. I'm also a taxpayer, a constituent. Um, I'm here in favor of this to save jobs. Um, what you're looking at is most of our bargaining unit will be impacted by this layoff. You're talking about laying off hardworking employees in just about every department. I've heard every one in every department in City Hall. Uh, like Andrew uh, said, at least five in DPW, 12 in police. Unfortunately, we are the only ones, the lower paid workers are affected. You, you don't see any big cuts in the higher level because that's just the way it works, but you're talking about the low average worker who can't afford to lose their job. Okay, you, you talk about people's livelihood here. If this is a measure that's gonna save jobs, you need to save people's jobs. These are your constituents. These are people that work hard for you. If you lose people in all these departments, every single department will be hurt by this. Jobs, uh, not jobs, the work will get backlogged. Pe the constituents out there are gonna be upset because nothing's getting done in the city. You're not gonna see any road work done. You're not gonna see any permits issued. You're not gonna see anything accomplished in this city. The whole city might as well just shut down because it's not going to happen. We're already at minimal staffing levels as it is. Some departments have two people in it. You lose one, one person can't do it all. Some departments have four people. You lose two people. Those other two people are not going to be able to handle it. I just think that if this is going to save jobs, it is well worth voting for. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
This is Karen Bartlett, Karen Richards, and um, we're here to represent Local 3147, and unfortunately a lot of people couldn't come, but we are definitely on, we definitely want to vote yes on this. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I, I also, speaking as a homeowner in Lynn, of a two family, I want to save jobs for my coworkers and the citizens of Lynn, so I, I hope that you do vote yes. Thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, councilors, Senate President. Um, I stand before you. My name is Michael O'Connor. I'm the president of Local 739, the Lynn Firefighters Union. I am here not only as a union member, but a taxpayer in the city. I stand. I am in favor of this fee, and the Lynn Firefighters Executive Board and Union are in favor of this fee. It is imperative that you, the councilors, vote in favor of this fee. As you have heard from previous speakers, the effect of a no vote could be catastrophic to the city. We are in support. I am in support of my brothers and sisters from the Lynn Police Department, City Hall, and DPW who will be affected by a no vote. So please consider a yes vote. Thank you. Are there any other union officials who would like to come to the podium and speak in favor? Hello. Hello, my name is Rich Germano. I've been up before. Um, I don't envy any uh, decisions tonight. It's a tough one. Uh, I am in favor of it. Um, also, the president of uh, my local. Um, I just don't think cutting, there is a problem. I don't think this is the right way to fix it. I don't want to see people get hurt. I've been around as a president and seen people be laid off and affect families and it, it's not, not, not a good thing for the city. We want a positive of it. In this time, we, you know, we'll, do, we'll have to figure out a way to fix it in, in another way, but other than laying people off, I would say. Not in hurting families, thank you. Thanks much. <coughs> Are there any other union officials who would like to come to the podium? Are there any union people in the audience that would just like to show their support for this by raising their hand? Janet, make a note of that. Okay, is there anyone else who would wish to come to the podium to speak in favor of this petition? Is there anyone else? It's nice to see a candidate up at the podium. <laughs> Wasn't my intention uh, walking in the room, so this could be suicide. Uh, my name is Rick Starbard. I live at 221 Verona Street in Lynn. Um, I can surely sympathize with all the speakers in the room tonight um, trying to, to maintain um, stability in the city and, and city services, especially public safety. Um, I think I can offer a little bit different perspective as I'm a commercial property investor in Revere, I lease to five to six different businesses at a time, including my own. Um, for that, I pay approximately $60,000 to the city of Revere. None of my tenants impact the school department. We all spend thousands per year in trash disposal fees, snow removal fees, and we're basically pure profit to the city, as most commercial businesses are to a community. I'm not complaining about what we pay, it's a cost of doing business. If I was to move that property a mile up the street into Lynn, push out all my commercial tenants and turn it residential, <coughs> my tax rate would drop in half. Undoubtedly, my tenants would send their children to the school system and the city would pick up my trash. I would still be a business person a property investor. I would pay income taxes on the profits that I enjoy from that business investment. I would write off my expenses as any other business owner would. But I would enjoy half the tax rate as a residential rate and that's protected by law. When we have in this city the number of non-owner occupied dwellings that we have, the burden on the city is tremendous. 
and I would even go, you know, be willing to accept non-owner, I'm sorry, owner-occupied multifamilies up to three, exempting the whole building. Because there is a value in having the owner reside in a property. Their eyes are on it continuously. They tend to take more pride in it than somebody that doesn't live there. But I think that this ordinance is fair and it's equitable. It's a small amount of money to maintain these people who provide safety and service to this city and its residents daily. With the large amount of non-owner occupied that we have, coupled with the amount of commercial businesses that we've lost, commercial properties that have been purchased by nonprofits and they then fall off the tax rolls, those numbers grow all the time. We lost two last year, one on Stetson Street and, and the Lucky Strike Bowling Alley. Those two buildings went off in a couple of weeks' time, and that was basically a cop's salary, gone. It's, it, it's on you as our city leaders to find unique, creative, and fair ways to fund the city services. And I think that this is one of them. So I would ask you all to please support this ordinance tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starbin. Is there anyone else wishing to get up and speak in favor? Jeffrey, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Seeing none. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone wishing? Please state your name and your address. Absolutely. Um, good evening, Marzi Galaska, 17 Portland Street. I would like to first and foremost thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and speak on this matter. Um, and second, I do want to thank the mayor as well as the public service providers within the city with the services that continue to provide. I am disappointed in hearing um, lack of discussion on the merits of the ordinance itself. We have heard of each and every person who's been here this evening about loss of potential positions within the city. Unfortunately, the way that um, the budgets work, it sounds like the current budget is unsustainable. I mean, I'm, I'm not the experts. It's up to this respectable board to really look at the budgets and really come up with a sound plan that would be sustainable. In terms of the way that the ordinance is written, all of us seem to pay the same rate in regards to if you're a um, a residential property, we all pay the same residential rate. If you're a commercial property, you pay a different rate. The way this ordinance is written, it appears that that really punishes non-owner occupied units. Our, our, my tenants as well as myself, we don't generate any more trash than anybody else. You were kind enough to implement um, single stream recycling. You have limited the numbers of or the size of the trash barrels that you collect. Each unit is, is as you know, is offered or presented with a one barrel and one recyclable container, and we continue to abide with those rules. I would just respectfully request that if you do look at almost punish individuals who own multifamily units, let's look at other alternatives. Have you, has the, the mayor or has the individuals who sponsored this, um, this ordinance, have they looked at other options? How about spreading this through, if we're looking at other options, you know, pay as you throw, single, you know, charge everybody the same, the same amount. I mean, we all generate the, the same amount of trash. I think that that's something else that, you know, I would suggest. How about doing additional education? If this is, if we're talking about trash, if maybe we're trying to save the amounts of money that it's costing us, uh, you know, let's do additional education where people are recycling more, you're throwing less trash away, therefore you're saving money on the amount, the, the cost of um, hauling and disposal. 
So these would just be, these are my concerns, and I respectfully request you, or request of you to vote no against this. And Elsie, really, don't punish the property owners who do have pride in our, in our properties, who do take care of our properties, and our taxpayers. And we continue to, to, to have the best interest of everybody, um, of, of our tenants, I should say. You know, what, what does happen if, if this fee is passed, and it's something that, penalizes, that's the best way to probably describe um, property owners, is that, you know, we will in turn push that fee onto our tenants. And our tenants, you know, I can say, speak for myself, that I don't charge full market rate, I charge below market, market rate. And I can tell you that, you know, um, I, I don't, my household does not generate additional pupils that attend the schools. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I do re respect that if there, if I need police presence or fire, I, I would expect that, you know, they would be there. And, and I am thankful for that, that the city has those services. Um, so again, I just ask that you look at alternatives, discuss other best practices that you might, um, you might have um, learned from other municipalities. We do have resources within the Commonwealth, Mass Municipal Association, I'm sure would be one of them, who would be able to provide us with many options as well as best practices that could apply um, to the city of Lynn as well. So again, thank you for the opportunity to comment and I respectfully request that you look at other options and really implement fairly and equitable the fee that should be paid by all of us, all, all uh, residents. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Hi everyone, um, my name is Rogelina. I am a bilingual city clerk. Um, I live in 289 Eastern Avenue. And one thing I recall about Lynn is coming here in my preteen years and feeling safe and feeling a balance of life. Um, now working for City Hall, I see the nuts and bolts of what keeps a city running, feeling safe and making people want to come and visit and stay. And if my job, um, as it is, will, might be in jeopardy, you will also be affecting single family um, homes um, like myself right now. And I will please urge you to reconsider and um, vote for this trash um, bill that's coming up. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually for a favor. It's a favor. Okay. The, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. The in favor part of the hearing is closed. So um, is anyone wishing to come up and speak in opposition? Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. What's the wish of the council? Motion to approve. Motion has been made, seconded. Discussion? Councilor Barton. Mr. President, um, as a former firefighter, and um, vice president and president of union. At one time, when I was vice president, I watched 50 guys go out the door. And then as president, I watched 30 guys go out the door. Let me tell you, these, as the uh, fire chief said, the department was never the same. I've watched people get divorced over this. This is, <clears throat> I'm getting emotional because it's, it's, it really hurts because I've seen families destroyed and um, we don't want to go there. We got to do everything in our power to make sure that nobody hits the street. It just does a number on families. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Biden. Councilor Cahill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I was wondering if uh, Peter Karen could come up and answer some questions. He's here. May I? Uh, Mr. Karen, um, what is the intent behind the trash fee, in your opinion, as CFO? Uh, the city, in crafting this budget, faced, uh, had two options, or a combination of two options, which was either to reduce cost, uh, since most of the budget on the city side is personnel costs, roughly $48 million out of $62 million 
of the city side budget is personnel, number one, and number two, uh, that we've pretty much stripped down the non-personnel budgets over the last several years in order to meet our school spending requirements, that uh, there were really just two options, either they're either cutting personnel or coming up with new revenues. Uh, one of the items we looked at, uh, we've looked at a number of items. Uh, we've increased the number of fees. The uh, council, in its wisdom, passed the uh, meals tax. Uh, we're looking at another, a number of other opportunities and options that will raise additional revenue that will be coming before this body over the next several months that uh, we hope will help close the gap further. But in reality, uh, you know, if, unless, unless we make cuts in personnel, we have to come up with new revenue. And the only significant item was the trash fee. Please keep in mind that uh, Lynn is, uh, would be considered an exception across the Commonwealth in terms of uh, trash fees. Uh, uh, most other cities do have trash fees, at least, rec which in this case recoup some of the solid waste costs. I would point out that the solid waste cost for the city of Lynn on an annual basis is just under six million dollars. Uh, we're not looking to recoup that entire cost. We're, lo we're looking to recoup part of that cost. Uh, but there's some cities and towns out there that r have their uh, citizens pay the entire cost or almost the entire cost of solid waste in the term of fee, in terms of fees. So it's not unusual. Most of the issues we looked at, uh, the other revenue options were limited in terms, of, in comparison to a trash fee, in terms of how much rev revenue they could raise. So that's why we f focus on the trash fee. It's not what we've done it with exclus exclusive of other uh, options. There are, you know, we've, we're installing new parking meters. We've increased the fees in several departments. Uh, you know, so we're looking at every option, but most of those options involve uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars here and there. This is the one item that allowed us to recoup an, uh, a significant amount of our uh, non personnel cost in terms and uh, provide relief to. Uh, at least maintain uh, staffing levels at their current level. And would you agree that it's an accurate statement to say that <clears throat> when we authorized other, other city departments to increase their fees, and we're talking about uh, death certificates going up, you know, from 10 to, you probably know the, the, the data actually better than I do, going up from $10 to $20 or maybe some dog license fees, that they were, they were minimal amounts of increases, correct? Yes, they, and in other words, they, they, those uh, items were not major revenue generators. They, they, they do increase revenues, but uh, uh, nothing that approaches the significance of the uh, trash fee. And would you say that um, those department fee increases were mainly implemented to offset the department itself, the cost of the departments themselves? Yeah, I think there were two, two things that were looked at. A, the actual cost of providing the service, and B, what other communities were selling, uh, charging for similar services. And that's uh, really what sort of drove whatever decisions were made. So unlike the city department fees that we've implemented, the trash fee, which would be implemented through the Department of Public Works, is to offset the entire city budget, correct? It's to offset the solid waste portion of the city budget, which, I, as I indicated, <laughs> was about $6 million. And how much do you hope to raise from the proposed trash fee? Uh, well, the, uh, the ultimate decision would be up to the DPW director in terms of what the fees are, but some of the numbers that have been discussed that the general parameters we anticipate that would raise about $2 million. Just, uh, th there's going to be further uh, review that's going to be necessary, but uh, we did a, uh, a quick uh, study by comparing uh, mailing addresses for tax bills uh, as opposed to the property address to determine uh, which properties were owner occupied and which ones weren't. So to get into the ordinance itself, um, why was it, why was the decision made to allow the Department of Public Works um, department head to set the fee and theoretically he or she could set the fee at zero dollars 
correct? Uh, I would defer to the uh, uh, assistant city solicitor on that issue, but uh, uh, in terms of what it could be set at, that it would be the termination of the DPW director. That, that's the way it's written. But will you have input on that as CFO as to how much money we're trying to raise? My obligation as CFO is simply to provide budget information to the, the, uh, the officials in terms of what revenue will be generated based on what decisions are made. I, I guess what I'm getting at is I'm confused at why um, something of this nature is being determined not by the CFO or, or by the mayor but by a department head and wouldn't it be a little self-serving to allow a department head to manipulate such a large portion of our budget by increasing fees say hypothetically next year or maybe in December we are laying off additional folks to have the DPW director unilaterally be able to increase fees or decrease fees uh, public policy wise as a CFO uh, does that raise any concerns as, as I as I stated, my, my job as CFO is not. I'm not an elected official, and I'm not. Uh, my my job is to make a determination: a) how much money we need to fund the budget, and b) what the ramifications of decisions made by other officials in the city in terms of how much revenue they will generate. And you made a recommendation that we implement the meals tax this year, correct? I, I made the notation that the meals tax would generate about $700,000. It was up to the elected officials to make the determination as to whether or not to move forward with that decision. And um, going back to the trash fee, will you be making a recommendation of what that trash fee would look like? No, I, I, I will. I, I'm, I'm sure I'll have some input in terms of discussing, mainly for, because. I'm going to have to make an analysis as to how much revenue it will generate in terms, you know, in other words, I, I'll be presented with some assumptions uh, as to if we, if we impose this fee, how much revenue will it generate. And you mentioned that you were hoping to raise $2 million, so you must have <coughs> some kind of idea of what that fee would look like. There's been some discussions based on the parameters we've discussed. Uh, the, the, what, the, one th the one guiding parameter would be that uh, the, based on the number of uh, units for which we pick up trash and the cost to pick that up, uh, it costs the city approximately $220 per unit to pick up trash. So that would sort of be a limitation in terms of, uh, we, uh, in terms of an upper level as to how much could be charged for uh, uh, trash removal. And just to switch gears, if I could, just a little bit, Mr. President, for your indulgence, there was a statement made that this trash fee is the only way to come up with substantial money in, in one fell swoop. Do you recall that being testified to? Uh, in terms of generating revenue, yes, short of an override of Prop 2.5. Can you tell me about where we are with negotiations for health insurance in the city? Uh, the uh, uh, coalition uh, uh, group that negotiates the insurance with the uh, administration. Uh, the may mayor made a uh, proposal to maintain th that that agreement expired expires on June 30th. Uh, there was a proposal to extend that for one year. Uh, some of the concerns that were raised were that there might be significant changes uh, in health care coming out of Washington, D.C., and be, uh, and what impact that would have so that it was decided by uh, the administration to uh, offer to uh, maintain the status quo for one year until we had a clearer picture of what the uh, regulatory changes were going to be. And in your experience negotiating uh, health care insurance rates, what could that be, uh, what could that translate to in terms of possible savings for the city? Uh, well, the, first of all, I've never been involved in negotiations with the, 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 the last negotiations preceded my appointment as a CFO. Uh, but I would say that uh, the, other, the, uh, uh, the other option would be the GIC that is out there that uh, 
that would uh, produce savings of approximately eight to nine million dollars over what we currently, the city share of the health insurance costs, keeping in mind, uh, now that's, assume, that, that's assuming, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't, uh, this, I haven't looked at this in the last few days, but I think that's assuming uh, employees pay 25% of the cost. And it's safe to say that cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth have utilized the um, leverage of the GIC with private health insurance providers to provide the same health care uh, through whether it's Tufts, Harvard, or uh, another provider, but yet negotiates rates down with a, th with a threatened fear of um, transitioning into the GIC. Uh, well, I think, I think the fear of transitioning is more on the employee side as opposed to the health insurance side. Obviously, the loss of business for health insurance companies would be the, the more uh, uh, concern on their part. Uh, I think the possibility of uh, uh, the savings incurred would fall more uh, on how the employees uh, would respond to that. Um, and uh, quickly, so the meals tax that we implemented, is the meals tax the number, the expect, anticipated revenue from the meals tax, is that, is that been included in your, in the proposed FY18 budget? Those, those revenue, well, we don't, we don't provide the revenues in the budget. It is, it is factored into. You counted them. It, it's, it's, that is an item that's being counted. Now, th at this point, we haven't, for example, we haven't counted, although the meters have been put in and, and more meters are going in and revenue is going to be generated from that, uh, we need some history before we can count a specific amount of revenue to be generated by something like that. And that applies also to, uh, in terms of uh, finalizing a revenue generation from, say, the trash tax, there'll be a much more intense level of uh, uh, you know, review and uh, determination as to eligibility for exemption from the <coughs> from, from the fee before we'll have be able to pin down a final number. And in the proposed budget that we're taking up today, in about maybe minutes, um, is or are the expected and anticipated revenue generated from a proposed trash fee also included? as or anticipated upon in this budget that we're being uh, taken up in a couple of minutes? Well, it's being anticipated as part of the revenue to offset the cost of the budget. So theoretically, um, if no money comes in from the meals tax and, and there's no trash fee or it's worth $3 million or, or $2.7 in the, the whole? The trash fee? If the trash fee isn't implemented and there's hypothetically no one goes to a restaurant next year, this budget that we're about to take up is is based on an assumption that $2.7 million will be generated? Yes. Uh, I have no further questions for Mr. Karen at this point. Council Walsh. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Karen, I just had a question. If we were to, to put an amendment in to this, and I'm thinking to some of the people that are in two and three family homes where it's primarily you know, next of kin on the second and third floors, typically the parents live on the first floor. Could we put an amendment in here to um, make them not have to pay for the trash? I, the I would defer floor? to the, uh, the, the, pers the legal expert on that. that. That is a lawful amendment. I would defer back to Mr. Karen what the financial uh, impact would be, but that is a lawful amendment uh, to uh, the, what's before you. That's kind of hard to determine. Obviously, if, uh, if I have a situation where the owner of the property uh, I have a brother and sister owning a property, and each of them live in a separate unit. That's clear cut. They both be would exempt. Uh, I mean, there'd have to be a, a, a significant amount of study done to determine, and I think the onus would fall on the property owners to uh, uh, raise the, the, their eligibility for an exemption to do that. I don't know who's who has brothers and sisters or parents living on uh, one of their uh, rental units. There's no way for me to do that. But if we were to put an amendment in and they were, you know, the burden was on them to prove that they had family next of kin, I would say, uh, living on the second and third floors, uh, would that, that would be a friendly amendment to be able to be added? That would be a lawful amendment. I, I, I would suggest that it should be first degree of kinship uh, rather than having Ancestry.com to see if you and I are related. Uh, 
hundreds and hundreds of years ago to make it easier for the DPW to make a determination if it's a, a blood relative, parent, child, or a sibling. So I, I guess I would make the amendment to, to, to what the ordinance is <laughs> to allow next of kin to also be uh, omitted from having to pay the trash fee if they live in the adjacent apartments to the people who own the property as a landlord living there. A second. So it's made into a motion, seconded. Um, Council Kayo. Thank you. If, if, if this just could be more detail on that. I, I understand the concept, but right. um, next of kin as a legal term can can really branch out. Right. Are we, are we talking brothers, sisters, mothers? Immediate family or? Well, I mean, what would you consider immediate family? Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. Kin should like, be like my second cousin for, twice removed. First degree. And children's. First degree of kinship, I, I think, would meet what uh, yep. Councilor Walsh is looking to accomplish. Yep. But I would, add, I would add that to the amendments degree of kinship. Motion. Councilor Jacudis. Yeah, I just have one question. Nobody wants to see anybody laid off. This is why we're here. My thing is, if we approve this, are we looking ahead now to December? Are we going to be back here asking the constituents of the city to be paying more money, more taxes? We need to look ahead because if this is going to happen again in December, we're back at the drawing board again. We're at the beginning. We're not accomplishing anything. Peter, you want to answer that? Do you want uh, to? Well, you, you, the problem would be $2 million more come December, and you'd have shorter time to deal with it. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's not by defeating by defeating the trash fee. You don't make the problem go away. You just make the problem worse. That we have a number of uh, initiatives that have to be acted on in the next few months. There's num a great degree of research that has to go in in determining how much re revenue those items will generate. So. Uh, uh, come December, when it comes time to set the tax rate, we have to produce a balanced budget under Proposition 2.5. If we can't do that, then you have two options, either come up with new revenues at that point in time or make uh, cuts to the existing budget in order to meet that requirement. Councilor Capano. Yeah, so yeah, I have some of the same concerns. I was going to ask the same question that uh, Councilor Chikudis asked. but. Well, I, I think what we'd like to know is a couple things. The, the $2.7 million in anticipated revenue, that's correct. It's what you said. Yes. So, so now that would, that, would, uh, that would assure that there would be no layoffs for the people we're trying to, in the services we're trying to protect it, it, and provide right, right now. Uh, the intent is to provide uh, no layoffs at this point in time and allow the council and allow the administration to come up with uh, additional revenues or additional savings elsewhere that don't affect jobs between now and December. So, so you know, I, I, to give you an example, uh, to give you an example, we have a proposal for the legislature home rule petition to move the custodians over to the school department. That would that would generate an additional savings of approximately oh, six to $800,000. Now, the, the, the uh, legislature has yet to act on it, understandably, that this is their busiest time of the year. They got a lot of issues on the table. But, you know, I mean, I, that, that there's six to $700,000 that I can count that reduces the problem. But if the legislature fails to act on it completely, then that's 700000 we don't get. No, I, I, that, that's you know, understandable. Those so are the kind the, of but questions. What, what I'm trying to find there. out, that there's, some, there's some assumptions that we, we can make, you know, and we could be wrong, but if you assume that that would happen, are there other, like I know uh, the marijuana dispensaries, uh, the host agreements haven't, uh, been done yet, and they will done be done soon, yeah. and, and that will generate. Uh, well, for example, you know, in the case of marijuana dispensaries, if if uh, uh, these agreements are reached prior to December, and there's a guaranteed amount of revenue that would come in between December and January, yes, we can count that money towards uh, uh, alleviating the problem uh, in terms of meeting the budget. 
but, but I need, you know, we just can't make the assumption it's going to happen. The Department of Revenue is going to want to see that it's an actual uh, guarantee. I understand, but I think, you know, uh, some, I think some of the councils would like to know that, you know, the, the, the assumptions that we have made in this budget is enough money. In other words, we wouldn't have to want to come back here again if we didn't have to. You know, that, and that's if we could do it all at once, as much as you know, as painful as it is, um, we want to make sure that you know we'd like to we'd like to see that happen rather than come back here again. You know, six months from now. Mm -hmm. Well, even even with the trash fee uh, approval, uh, there is still work to do to produce a balanced budget between now and December. Can I, before we go any further, I just want to say, um, if we, and, I, and I am obviously in favor of the trash fee, if we do not vote for this now and vote in favor of it, what we are looking at is 40 jobs within days. That's police officers, ISD people. It's, it's every department in the city. It's services to the city. By doing this now, it helps us down the road in December. We're still going to be faced with a crisis, a couple of million dollars. This isn't going to satisfy the problem, but it's going to help us tremendously. As Peter stated, um, that we have other sources. You stated it. The plot is going to be coming in. We're looking at um, some city properties in the city to sell. We're looking at some other properties that can bring in quite a bit of money, but can only be used for bondable projects, but that can be used to help offset the budget in other ways, excuse me, in other ways. Um, we can sit here, and, and I know Councilor Trent and Councilor LaPierre have some questions to, to ask, but um, we're at a junction. We can choose to go right and continue down the road, or we can go left and go into a cul-de-sac and not know which way to go. So that's up to us, Councilor Trahant. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Now, I, I just had a uh, couple questions. Now, is this going to be a permanent fee to the residents of the city? Has anybody, have we, you know, has, is that going to be? I, I would assume once it becomes an ordinance, it's, it's, it's there until the council uh, you know, rejects the ordinance at some point in time. I would say historically, most communities that have initiated trash fees have maintained those trash fees over the years. I know, uh, uh, you know, it's it's just the same problem. The budgetary strains. Keeping keeping in mind that uh, Prop Two and a Half only allows us to increase our revenues on the property tax portion of our revenues by two and a half percent. As Dr. Latham noted that we've had very little increase in uh, non-Chapter 70 state aid, uh, number one. And number two, we've had significant increases in uh, uh, state cherry seed charges. So our net state aid, other than Chapter 70, is basically hardly changed at all over the last several years. So when you factor that, all that money coming in, and, you know, you know, we're faced with a situation with a school department which makes up about, uh, you know, when you take in all the uh, indirect costs, makes up about two-thirds of the city's budget. Uh, that number keeps going up by four, five percent each year, yet our revenues only go up by maybe a percent and a half or a percent and a quarter or three quarters, uh, there's got to be a choice. You either raise other revenues or you start making uh, cuts elsewhere other than the school budget. And keeping in mind, you, you, you've got to make those cuts. You're only dealing with one third of the budget at that point. So it's... Council Lapierre. Um, I would defer to Council Cahill before. Council Losey is next after. Uh, I'll defer to Council Kay. Okay. I, Council Kay. I really appreciate that, Council, just because I want to get into Chapter 70 stuff because there's a lot of talk about Chapter 70. Um, Mr. Karen, are you familiar with percentages that cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth get in Chapter 70 and in, um, uh, in other uh, funding from the state? Like, 
local aid? Uh, I've had, I don't have enough time to, other than to focus on Lynn, but roughly Chapter 70 pays about uh, uh, 75 uh, percent of our spending requirements on school. The, roughly, our requirement for this year is $200,000. They're giving us $150,000. So, million. Oh, million, excuse me. Would you know, keep, keeping, keeping in mind that if they give us more money, that's great, but it's only 75% of what we need. So, so, you know, a lot of people just say, well, you know, Chapter 70 will cover it if the costs go up. But, uh, but you know, if, if school costs go up an additional $4 million due to additional uh, students coming in or something, the city's still going to get stuck paying a million dollars of that additional bill. So let me ask you this. So out of the top 10 urban school districts, would you say that Lynn receives near the top of reimbursement or near the bottom of reimbursement? I, I, would, I would say that we're probably consistent with the other gateway cities and we're near, you know, we're near in the uh, in percentage basis, we're probably in the top 10 percent, you know, that in terms of probably even higher than that. So out of 351 cities and towns, Lynn probably fares in the top 10 of those, t of those cities and towns as far as reimbursement percentage-wise. Very likely. Okay, so every other city in town is getting less money reimbursed from the state, correct? Uh, I have to assume, I, I mean, it, would be a, it, would be a, it wouldn't be a crazy assumption to make that. I'm, I, don't, I mean, I, I just I'd, have to, I'd have to do investigation. I, I just want to make the point that this isn't, uh, this isn't, you know, a lot of some cities and towns are able to meet their requirements. So this isn't a, we don't get enough. Unfortunately, yes, we are not reimbursed 100%. All right, no community is reimbursed 100%. There is a net school spending requirement, and it seems like 350 or 349 school districts meet it, but we don't. That being said, is it also true that the governor changed the formula recently in what is consistent, what is um, categorized as a low income student? And therefore, the city of Lynn uh, potentially had lost several millions of dollars in reimbursement. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, whether it was a federal definition or a state definition, but there was a definition change, and that caused us to lose some money. I do know that the, if I'm not mistaken, the budget last year did provide additional relief for those uh, uh, districts that uh, had that kind of shift that occurred and that this Lynn did benefit from that. Was that the, th the, the roughly $3 million that the legislature um, put back in to uh, aid, so Chapter 78, after uh, the cuts from the governor? Uh, I have to assume so. Okay, so I'm just curious. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we're not pointing fingers at, uh, at each other, that there are a lot of factors that are uh, adding to the stress upon the city of Lynn. And it's, and I would argue it's not children um, that are doing that, but there are multitudes of issues facing this city. Uh, and this uh, debate has, has stirred up a, a great segue into a budget debate uh, where we should air out all of our grievances and differences and find out uh, exactly what is going on with our city's finances and how we can appropriately remedy it. And that being said, and I, and I, I do appreciate the, the gentleman from uh, Ward one and that large uh, yielding to me, um, and I'll just I'll just end I think on the idea that I wholeheartedly appreciate the drafting of this of this ordinance. I'm, I'm going to vote for it. Um, however, and we talked about coming back in December. Uh, Council Chakut has mentioned that. I just don't understand. And, and now we have another friendly. We have an amendment uh, to create more exemptions. I just feel like it's getting very complicated, in that it doesn't need to be complicated. And that it probably could be one sentence that just says the mayor or the CFO is permitted to um, institute a trash fee. Probably it'll be a lot easier because then it would apply to potentially everyone, potentially a small class of folks. Uh, and it would be easily amenable because we wouldn't have to come back and change ordinances in the future. Or in December, we may not have our CFO standing before us saying, hey, the trash fee was very successful, we raised $2 million, we need another $2 million, we need you to expand this ordinance to include single family homes. But that's not before us today. Um, and I appreciate the amount of work put into this. And I understand why people put amount of work into this, because you're trying to satisfy a lot of different folks. But 
you know, if we are in the situation we are in, we need to look at everything. So I'm going to yield my time back to the gentleman who let me speak, and I appreciate the time. Council Trot. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before we vote on the friendly amendment, um, do we know what it cost before we make that vote, like what that's going to take away from the uh, supposedly $2 million that we're going to raise? Like, a, like how much is it going to take? Now are we going to make a vote on that tonight, accept that friendly um, amendment, and then we're still going to have to lay people off? I, I don't know if anybody here has those answers. Mr. Cameron has a rough idea of money value. I, I have no idea as to how many, how many uh, uh, first degree kinship people are living in rental units uh, that are owned that they don't own. I, I just don't they, know. They would have to prove it themselves. And they would probably be judged, as anybody else would, until they were able to bring in birth certificates and bills and all the other things that they probably need to do. I mean, we don't have the resources or the manpower to do that. Right? You know, I mean, you have, tr you have children that uh, have different last names than their parents. And so we, you know, checking the census records, we would probably assume that there's no relationship and when, in fact, there was. It's just impossible to do any kind of close study on that okay so once we if we all vote in favor of this this friendly amendment um so there'll be no taking it back so i, I didn't know how strongly um my f good friend and colleague from ward seven feels about maybe rescinding the vote i don't know how much money it is but i, I, I but feel I hate very to see very strongly that that has to be in there that the amount of people i mean, I mean so to, to what everyone's kind of spoken about here. I'm not really understanding why we're not charging single families also. But I'm looking at, you know, there's people that are, that are living in um, multifamily houses in my neighborhood who have lived there for 30, 40 years, maybe longer, and their kids live upstairs from them. I'm going to ask Attorney Lamana to come up to the... Every, everyone under this uh, ordinance would get a bill, and it would be incumbent upon them to come, uh, presumably, to the Department of Public Works and, and have satisfactory evidence that they are first degree of kinship. Uh, but until it's in effect, and until we find out how many people appear, it, it probably is impossible to, to know how much of that $2 million will be affected. Yeah, I, again, I'm just, sorry, Mr. Uh, Councilor Pierre, I just, uh, I'm just sitting here, I'm looking around the room with all these police officers, fire, DPW, people that run City Hall. Um, our clerk spoke so uh, passionately. I mean, I just don't want to, if we're going to take this tough vote, all of us, including the mayor with us, um, I just, you know, it, we had a good thing in place, this ordinance. I think we should, I, I would like to see it kind of stay together and because we know we're going to get $2 million. We know we can save the jobs. We know we're not going to put anybody on the street before the holidays. I just, you know, I, I, I hate to, I can't control it, but I sure hate to see it. You know, I, I hate to see layoffs. Thank you. I'm going to let Councillor Waltz, because he seems like he wants to respond yeah, to I, Councilor I do. I, just, I, I would say that the same thing is going to lie with what's in this ordinance. It's going to say how many people are over the age of 60 that reside at the residence or have a life estate. I mean, there's, do we have an exact number on that? Uh, although that's in there, uh, so how, well, how does that affect the price tag that we're coming up with? Do we know the numbers on that? No, we don't. Okay. Once so again, it, so very similar to the amendment that I've added. Yeah. Th I mean, that's already in there, and that's you know being assumed, like a lot of things I think tonight. So I feel very strongly about that amendment. Councilor Capano. Yeah, I feel strongly about it too. I, I'm, there's a lot of people that live a lot of the neighborhoods where there are multi-family homes. There are uh, a lot of families that have choices over the years to move to other neighborhoods or the kids had choices to move, but they chose to try to keep their families together and they've done that using, you know, a two or three family house. So, you know, you know, I know we do a lot to try to attract people from Boston to come here and move here and people, single people with disposable income, which is all stuff that I've supported, but you know, we need to do something for people that actually have lived here for a long time and have wanted to live in Lynn and have wanted to live in some of the neighborhoods that, that they live in. I, I mean, I, I just... I don't think it's a big sacrifice, and I think there are plenty of uh, opportunities coming up, you know, to raise revenue. And if we have to revisit this again, we said we're going to come back in December. There's a chance we could have to come back in December, you know, so we can adjust 
you know, on the fly, you know, when, when we do that. I don't think this is really going to uh, make a big difference here. And I think, you know, it, like like uh, Council Walsh said, I mean, if we if we were really wanted to raise some revenue, we'd be raising it on the, everybody, single family houses. I mean, in a lot of ways, the people the people in the apartments, a lot of them are the people that can afford it the least. And I know that we're presenting some of this as this is the out of town landlords coming in, we're going to sock it to them, but some of them will pass that cost on to the people in the apartments. So, you know, I, I'm going to support this here, but I'd like to see this amendment, and I'm willing to come back, you know, in December, and, you know, I, I, I'm all for more services. I don't want to see any cuts. You know, I don't want to see the police cut, the fire, DPW, ISD, or any Anybody, you know, but uh, I do think that is something that that we could do. And, and that, like I said, if we have to adjust down the road, you know, we'll be back. Thank you, Council Capano. Council Trahan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, through the chair to Mr. Karen, what would be the average increase to every taxpayer in the city to raise the two point seven million dollars? Seventy-five dollars per unit. We already paid. Oh. To Two point well uh, for two it, it's it, there's two there's two there's twenty seven thousand so if we charge every unit a hundred dollars it would raise two point seven million dollars. Okay, Mr. President. And if I might say, I agree with Councillor Capano, and I think the numbers of households, multifamilies that have, you know, a son or a daughter living up above a mother or a father. I don't think the percentage is that high. And if we find that it is and, and it's not working, we can always come back and we can always take a look at it. Councilor Walsh. President, I'd like to call for the vote on the friendly amendment, please. Second. Uh, okay. Call on the vote. Roll call. So call on the amendment. On the amendment. On the amendment. Council Barton? Yes. Yes. Council Cahill? On the amendment. On the amendment. <laughs> Who said that? You can call in tomorrow. No. No. Council Capano. Yes. Yes. Council Chakutis. Yes. Yes. Council Colucci. Yes. Yes. Council Sear. Yes. Yes. Council Lapierre. No. No. Council Lozzi. Yes. Yes. Council Net. Yes. Yes. Council Trahant. No. No, Council Walsh. Yes. Yes. I make a motion to make that last motion unanimous. <laughs> Second. Okay, motion made, seconded. Roll call. <clears throat> From the trash ordinance. Council Barton. Yes. Yes. Council Cahill. Oh, yes. Yes. Council Capano. Yes. Yes. Council Chacutis. Yes. Yes. Council Colucci. Yes. Yes. Council Sear. Yes. Yes. Council Lapierre. Yes. Yes. Council Lozzi. Uh, clarification, that's on the amendment? No, this is on the trash to ordinance. Make it, no, amendment. that's on the amendment. The amendment. The amendment. The amendment. amendment. The amendment. Thank you, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Council we take the roll call, yeah. Yeah, the roll call on the amendment. Yes. Yes. Council Nett? Yes. Yes. Council Trahant? Yes. Yes. Council Walsh? Yes. Yes. So that's unanimous. Everybody voted in favor of the amendment. Good job. Council Biden? On the original motion. Motion made to vote on it. Second. Seconded. Roll call. Council Barton. Yes. Yes. Council Cahill. Yes. Yes. Council Capano. Yes. Yes. Council Chacutis. Yes. Yes. Council Colucci. Yes. Yes. Council Sear. Yes. Yes. Council Lapierre. Yes. Yes. Council Lozzi. Yes. Yes. Council Nett. Yes. Yes. Council Trahant. Yes. Yes. Council Walsh. Yes. Yes. Eleven yes. Good job. We'll take a five minute recess. I just want to say thank you to everyone who came and spoke tonight on both sides. Good job. Not even once. You're in there. I had some things to say, not a lot, but some. Testing. No, I just said that last year she was here at like 10:30. Mm -hmm. I kept going up 
It's my last favor. Council meeting back in session. Um, I'm going to ask the mayor and Peter Karen if they want to come up and sit up at the table up here, please. We're going to open up the public hearing on the budget. Yeah, that's what I'm going to ask you to do, just explain the the budget and if the councils have any questions and then we'll go on to the public hearing. Do you want to come up, Spence? Uh -huh. Since you're a part of the... Whoever wants to start, um, we're going to have the mayor and Mr. Spencer and Mr. Karen. They're going to explain the budget and then we'll yeah. have some questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying, this, this microphone is uh, not too self supporting. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to give you just a general overview of where the budget is currently and how it breaks down. And as I had said in my statements uh, sponsoring an, or, or advocating for an approval of the trash fee, um, that was tied very intricately into the budget preparation process this year. Um, and I thank you all very much for, for voting to approve that. That will help us to ensure that we can maintain current city ser services at the level that they are. So I appreciate that. The budget before you, it, and I'm going to use round numbers within $1,000, is $304,731,000 of spending. I want to explain to you how little we have left to cut and how, how desperately needed this, this trash fee was in order for us to get to a workable budget. The school department, which all of you know, is a mandated amount, is 143,983,000. So that leaves us with what? 160,748,000. Take off 2.06 million for FICA, for the federal government, and we're down to 158,688,000. Take off 40670000 for the life and health insurance costs for the city, and you're down to a little over $118 million. Take off $1.4 million for our liability insurance, and you're down to $116,618,000. There's $8.5 million um, slated for debt service. One hundred, that leaves us $108,118,000. Take off $28,139,000 uh, 
for pension obligations, and that brings us down to about $80 million. We have about $52 million in salaries in this year's budget. That leaves us with $28 million in expenses that we could look at to see whether there was something to cut. Now I have to explain what some of those expenses are because they are things such as unemployment, workers' compensation. There is the senior center in there. The, the, uh, by the way, the unemployment and the workers' comp totals about $3 million total. Our trash fee is usually $6 million, um, but I cut it down uh, after speaking with waste management and got us to $5.5 million for this upcoming year, and the other $500,000 is being deferred over the following three years. All of the energy efficiency contracts that we have cannot be cut out of that $28 million. <coughs> and the street lights, which cost about a million dollars a year to operate, can't be taken out of that. So when you look at everything and take it all into effect, there might be <clears throat> about $7 million that we could look at as being cuttable in, as far as preparing the budget. That includes things like office supplies, toner, bandages, Narcan for the ambulances, for the police, bullets, um, you know, bulletproof vests, cleaning supplies for, for anybody that's doing the cleaning, the custodians. Um, there was really nothing left to cut that would get us to a balanced budget without, again, the, the money that would be generated by the trash fee. So um, we did take some steps to further tighten those things that I mentioned. Office supplies, for example, were cut by 30% across the board. I want everyone to take notice of the city clerk's example and start printing on double sides of the printer, of the paper. If that's going to be a draft, that can certainly be done. We're urging everybody to design their own templates so we don't have to go out for letterhead. We can just print up the, t the template of the letterhead and take it right off of the computer. Um, we have consolidated the gasoline items because we have a very convoluted way of paying for gasoline in the city. Let's say we give the police department, I'm gonna, just gonna use round numbers, $150,000 for their gasoline. They go down to the DPW pumps, they fill up the, the cruisers. At the end of a month, the DPW sends them a bill for their gas usage. This, the police station, the police department remits their payment for their gas bill out of their gas line item. And in the end, people who are underusing their gas budget are transferring it into other line items. The DPW is taking the excess of funding that they get from people sending in their remittances and transferring that to other items. So by having that one consolidated gas line item, first of all, we're, we're making the transaction far more efficient, and secondly, it, allow, it allows the, the financial team to keep a much closer monthly watch on how the gas is being utilized and how much excess uh, because it usually is excess money, would be in that gas line item. Uh, we have also looked at a number of other revenue producing things that may be coming in the near future. First among these I want to mention, you may have heard something about them, is the sale of the old Eastern Avenue fire station known as Engine 8 and the old Thurgood Marshall Middle School on Porter Street. We're current, we, we just recently had a school committee vote passed that would allow us to put together an RFP to try to get some bids on the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. The fire station, as I understand it, is in the process of starting up neighborhood meetings and may be able to eventually, in the next fiscal year, um, might be a little bit later than that, but in the near, relatively near future, be an item that can come up for sale. Now that in and of itself, as with the Thurgood Marshall Middle School, does not help with the operational budget, the budget that we're here to approve tonight. But it does help us to relieve the strain on that budget in some ways, because the sale of public property can only be used for bondable projects. So that means things like our, our lease of the fleet of cars 
or our lease to own the, the tower on the, the fire department that we just bought, those would all be able to be taken out of the budget and provide like a little relief, a little pressure valve release because we'd be able to pay for those with the revenues that would be generated by the sales of, of those two properties. I had already mentioned that I sat down with waste management and I asked them if they would consider a deferral of the monies that we owe. And I'm gonna explain why I did a deferral without it, without, I don't want you to think that it's a kicking the can down the road because after I tell you what we've looked at, I'm going to tell you some of the good news that we see on the horizon to, to again, take a little pressure off of the budget for the city. Um, <clears throat> the health insurance, this year we have gone from completely self-insured to a premium-based health care. Um, we, we haven't, okay. We were, okay. We looked into, I will say, premium-based health insurance. The idea behind looking into premium-based health insurance was that the cost was going to remain relatively the same, but when it came time to calculate net school spending, it gave us a firmer, clearer number, so that reduced the uncertainty um, that we would be facing when the Department of uh, Education comes down in December and gives us our actual net school spending obligation for the year. Everything is speculation until they give you that final number six months into the fiscal year. It's a crazy method, but that's what we have to live with. Um, ultimately, as Mr. Karen just said, it was not able to be done because it would have been too expensive. Another thing that I'm going to ask the union um, negotiators to consider, and I've done this many times, and they haven't um, seemed very receptive to the idea, but I think it's time to take a serious look at two-tiered uh, employment contracts, collective bargaining agreements here in the city of Lynn, because the rate at which we are having uh, pay increases and step increases and longevity uh, payment amounts is unsustainable over the long term. And if we can get a hold on that, and have any new employees maybe have longer times between steps or start out at a different pay rate from what other people had started with, if their longevity takes a little bit longer, if we can recapture some unused sick days, personal days, vacation days, stop deferral of all of those things, it's going to make for a healthier budget. Again, uh, we haven't really been able to um, make much headway in there, but we do have a few new changes in union leadership, and we're going to bring the idea to the table again. Um, the next thing is, as uh, Mr. Karen had mentioned in discussing the trash fee, <clears throat> the health insurance agreement was extended through to June 30th, 2018, and as he explained, that was for us to keep, again, a firm set number that we could utilize in developing this budget. We don't know what's going on at, uh, in Washington, D.C. It changes literally on a daily basis. As of four o'clock this afternoon, there was supposed to be a vote on the Senate, the U.S. Senate's proposed health care bill, and that was canceled. So we're watching day by day to see what happens in Washington and to see whether that effect has an effect on us. We do predict, however, that regardless of what goes on over there, we're probably going to be have to have to be looking at higher percentages of employee contributions in the future when the next um, health insurance agreement is negotiated with all of the city's labor unions. We have considered the idea of privatizing the advanced life support. I have figures over the last several years, six or seven years, and uh, Stephen Spencer can give you more specifics on this if you would like. If you discount the one year where we only lost $300,000 because we had a significant uptick in collection efficiency, every other year other than that, we've been losing four to $600,000 on the, the ambulance service. So it's something that we can look into as a cost savings for the city. We're looking into more creative use of the fire department personnel who are on the so-called day division or division five. Right now, there's a minimum manning requirement that we have to meet in the fire department for every shift. So if people call out sick 
and we're not meeting minimum manning, manning, the bodies are replaced through overtime, which makes the overtime budget become very expensive over time. If we were to take some of those day division people and it, deploy them back to the first four divisions, which are the rotating divisions who are on apparatus, I think we would be able to save, save some significant dollars as far as the overtime budget. And while I'm on the fire department overtime budget, the original document that I submitted to you had about $318,000 budgeted for overtime for the fire department. By looking at some of the expenditures on the expense lines in the fire department, we were able to move some of those um, items up to additional overtime money, and I believe the new figure is 671, 670, what is the, 619? Anyway, it, it almost doubled, so we, we were addressing that. The uh, police department, when, when they've been talking to you about how they need to get more efficient use of their personnel, they need to get them out on the street. Um, this year they cut the Police Student Academy. It was a very popular summer program. We really, really enjoyed hosting it for people. Um, however, we need uniformed officers in the patrol cars and out on the streets, and the chief, um, in his wisdom, decided that he could not have three people tied up at a student academy five days a week for six weeks during the summer. So we're hoping to be able to bring that back, but in the meantime, we needed those bodies out on the street. We're also looking at the possibility of charging a facilities fee on auditorium tickets. Um, we looked at what would have been generated Judging by last year's total ticket count for the auditorium, uh, that if we were to have a $2 facilities fee to kind of defer the cost of operating the additional electricity and the air conditioning and so forth that goes into putting on an auditorium show would generate about $100,000 for um, the city. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I might note as an, as an aside, I would tend to disagree with the CFO's answer to the question, um, I think it was Councillor Cahill who asked, were the, the, um, the um, increase in charges at the city clerk's office, were those intended to go back to the city clerk's office? Um, I see them as going back to the general fund. Um, same thing with the ISD, the ISD sets the fees for all its building permits, those don't go into some kind of revolving fund or enterprise fund for the ISD. They come back to the general fund. Same thing with the city clerk and the same thing with the um, trash fee that was just recently approved. Um, the other thing that we are looking at is uh, parking fees. Right now, you can park for $2 all night after 5 or 6 p.m. in our lots. I don't think it would be unreasonable to move that up excuse me again, I'm sorry, <coughs> to three or four dollars for an entire night, and maybe the daytime fees or rates could be adjusted accordingly. We're also installing some new meters. I mean, why is it, if you come down Essex Street, you will notice um, near the courthouse there are metered spaces, and across from the courthouse there aren't metered spaces. So the people who are in the know come early so they get free parking all day. And the people who aren't, and we're not capturing any of that revenue. Uh, and the people who are late arrivers have to pay the fee. So we're trying to make that a um, little fairer over by the courthouse and in some other places. And then lastly, the meals tax that you just generated is, uh, is part of the um, good news, I would say, once we get past FY 2018. First of all, um, the meals tax is going to be bringing in some expected revenue. Secondly, we're going to be uh, retiring some of our debt. The debt uh, figure went down from about $12 million last year to I think it was $8.5 million this year in debt service, and that number is going to continue to decline over the next year and, and ongoing uh, unless we have n new projects that, for which we incur debt. Um, <coughs> the revenue from the marijuana dispensaries is going to create hundreds of thousands of dollars as well. Uh, and as you can see, all of these that we're talking about are 
a hundred thousand dollars, four hundred, seven hundred, none of them were getting us to that two million dollars that that we were able to achieve through the passage of the trash fee. And last thing, there are two more significant um, repayments that we are in the midst of that are going to be going away after FY18. One is, if you recall the horrible winter of 2015, every community in Massachusetts, I would guess, uh, thank you, um, overspent their snow budgets substantially. And if you want the exact figure, again, Peter or Steve can give it to you. Um, the state, in order to ease the burden on, on a, the communities, instead of having us pay back the next year, as is customarily the case, gave us three years to pay it off. So we have several hundred thousand dollars that will finally be retired. Just like the snow banks didn't melt till July, the payment for it doesn't go away till FY18, but it will be going away. <coughs> and then lastly, our net school spending payback that um, was arranged through the Department of Education, which ended up being a four-year repayment of about $2.2 million per year. This is the last year of the net school spending payback, so we'll be in the clear after that. Um, to one more, year. one more. However, light at the end of the tunnel. We're coming out of the tunnel on that. Uh, so we do have a number of things that are going to uh, ease ease the budget over the next few years. Uh, sorry, the next few months. And I will then turn this over to Steve, Steve Spencer so he can give his view of the budget. Then to Mr. Karen, and then we're all available for questions. Thank you. Uh, basically, uh, just to reiterate, uh, the fire department's overtime budget is 617. I just want to clarify that point. Um, and $500,000 is what our amortization is for our snow and ice for the 2015. Could you speak up, please? What? What was the last figure on the snow removal? Uh, $500,000 was the uh, 2015 amortization. Uh, basically, other than that, uh, I'm just up here to answer questions uh, that would come my way. Uh, I think I think the mayor covered most of the uh, uh, essential items. Uh, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of uh, producing revenue to support this without any further cuts. So. But I'd be more than happy to answer any questions for the councils. Councilor Bud. Um, Mayor, um, I know you're talking about the fire department and the Division Five, and um, d you know, kind of doing away with it. No, not doing away with it. No, but just any cuts to Division Five, where they are so understaffed. Um, the Fire Prevention Bureau has done 130 plus smoke detectors for the sales of real estate. Who is going to do those and all other duties of the fire prevention, along with all the other duties, and what about the losses or revenue for those? Plus, can, I, can I answer that one first? Go ahead, go ahead. Fire prevention is not on the table as far as I'm concerned. The ones that I am specifically looking at is we have a full-time, daytime arson investigator. If we were to take the arson investigator, put the arson investigator back on a piece of apparatus. Whenever we have a suspicious fire, that person can come off the apparatus, do the arson investigation, cover, cover that shift with overtime, and then return once the arson investigation is completed. The second one that I'm looking at on Division 5 in particular, I'm not saying these are the only ones, but I'm saying one that definitely isn't is fire prevention, one that definitely is being looked at is the arson investigator, and the other one that definitely is being looked at is emergency management. When I came into City Hall in, in 2010, the emergency manager, manager <coughs> was a stipend position. That person got about $10,000 a year, I think, to be the city's emergency manager. When we had Captain Hines, on the fire department, and we had some money available that year. I turned it into a full 
nine months on a piece of equipment, uh, I mean nine months as emergency manager, three months on a piece of equipment for the year. And that raised the emergency management budget to $100,000 from $10,000. We operated, and it doesn't have anything to do with 9-11, because as I said, when I came in here in 2010, it was a $10,000 stipend. Now it's $100,000, and we're losing a, a guy, or a lady, in this case a guy, off a piece of an apparatus for nine months out of the year. So I'm looking at the possibility of returning it to a $10,000 a year stipend with that person spending 12 months a year on the piece of equipment, again, to keep an eye on the overtime. But fire prevention is not one that looks like it is going to okay, be okay, effective. Mayor, that, uh, the arson squad, that would be like <clears throat> asking a detective doing a murder investigation to stop the investigate while there's while nothing going on to go be a, a patrolman. That would be the same thing because these guys are, you know, going and they're discovering bodies and fires and they're doing all kinds of that, that, that's arson. True. That's true, but, they, it's, but it's, they're almost like a police officer. But they, they have don't, the powers of a police officer. But they don't do it. 40 hours, uh, five days a week from nine to five. But they're probably doing paperwork or something else. Uh, and there may be paperwork, but I, I'm curious, uh, and you may know the answer to this, I don't, but this is why I want to look into it. How many fires last year in the city of Lynn were deemed suspicious? And what was the average length of time, a number of hours that it took to complete an investigation on each of those fires? I couldn't tell you that off And I can't but. tell you that off the top of my head either. Right. It may be that the arson squad goes 80 hours a week, and I have to take that one away from consideration. But my suspicion is, having been, as you know, to 90% of the fires that have taken place in the city in the last seven and a half years, that almost every time, almost every time, there's a quick resolution. Usually they can find the natural cause. I would say out of those seven years, 30 or 40 might be arson investigated. I don't know. Mayor, there but there's so much that goes on in that department <coughs> that you don't know about. And that's why I have to educate myself. But what I'm saying is this is a possible. What do you mean possible. you have to educate yourself? You have a chief here that runs the fire department. You should be relying on him to handle the day-to-day -day operations of the Lynn <coughs> Fire Department. I'm not trying to interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of so the Lynn Fire Department. You are definitely department. trying to interfere with the day-to-day -day operations if you're not listening to what the chief is telling you. I am you. absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to get into a detailed argument about my point of view of fire department operations and the differing point of view on fire department operations because it's currently in court. So I can't really go too far into it. I'm trying to give you general examples of ways that we can increase the efficiency of the fire department and cut down on the use of overtime so that we can meet the minimum manning that's required under the contract. That's the extent to which I want to give details about it. I was just trying to give you a couple of examples. I'm not trying to fluff off the, the, the thoughts of the, of the fire chief, but we do have some differences of opinion on when overtime is needed and when it isn't. And again, that's getting a little too close to the litigation, so I can't expound on that but it will all okay, be discussed. I, I just hope you respect his wishes because the man's been a firefighter for close to 40 years. I expect, I, think he knows I, how to run that department. I respect every member of the fire department, but I also have to do my due diligence in making sure that the city of Lynn is following best practices. That's all. Councilor Lowe's. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Madam Mayor, um, I, I appreciate that you want to uh, make sure that they're following best management practices. And I have a quick question and then another comment. Okay. Have you sat down with the chief and discussed these ideas with him? Some of them, yes. Some of them, but not, not all of them. Not all of them, but some of them. And we haven't reached resolution on anything. It was more starting the conversation for something that was not going to be taking place in time to, to affect the FY18 budget. But it is something that 
I'm hoping will allow us to make some adjustments as we go through the FY18 budget to get it closer to being uh, revenue neutral, which is what we're well, trying to do. I appreciate you bringing that up, but Madam Mayor, if it's not going to be incorporated into this budget at this time, I don't know that it's really pertinent. That it absolutely is because well, I think I actually I think you need to speak with the uh, chief and discuss that matter. He is the department head, and if you have ideas, I think you need to bring it to him. And I certainly don't want to be a part of micromanaging any department. I, I, I appreciate the questions you're asking, uh, that you're raising, but I think you need to sit down with the, with the chief I, I before have, you do I this. sent him a letter at the end of May indicating all of these areas that I would like to look further into. And I certainly will listen to him, but I also want to make sure that the city of Lynn is following best practices. That the chief has been the chief for three years, five years? How long? Five years? Okay. And you were the deputy chief for about three years? Two? Okay. So that's seven years of, of experience in a chief's role. And maybe the NFPA, maybe somebody else, I don't know, has other people with 20 or 30 years experience in a chief's role that might be able to give me a differing point of view from the one gentleman that I have serving as my fire chief right now. Moving That's forward. all I'm saying. It doesn't hurt Thank you, to Madam ask Mayor. questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I think this question might be for any of the three up there. Um, what was the overtime in the budget last year? For the fire department. Submitted, but the, the budget the, amount. Yes, the budget the the uh, the amount spent. Oh, the amount spent. One point one. So, it sounds like we've got a deficit coming up. Well, it was fun. Basically, the, the, it's a two pronged question, Councilor. Uh, what was budgeted and what was what was actually expended. spent. So. Uh, the budgeted amount, I want to say, was seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. Six twenty-eight three. Is the actual and, and that number amount. you're quoting is is budgeted for fiscal year seventeen. Two, seventeen. And the, the council voted on the budget at this time last year. Six twenty-eight three. Okay, and the actual amount that was necessary or, or was spent. Uh, that's it's actually should be here. Uh, one 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 point two million. Can I just explain? Every year, if you look at the budgets over the last several years, you've seen, you'll see, I think one was 520 or thereabouts, one was 445. We have never budgeted the full amount of what we actually spend in overtime because it's an inherently unknowable number. We can't tell how many people are going to be sick. We can't tell how many people are going to be injured. We can't tell when there's going to be a six alarm fire or some natural disaster where we have to call people in, a snowstorm, a rescue, you name it. Um, there are always going to be unforeseen factors that drive that number either up or down. But we always have fully funded whatever our obligation has been at the end of the day for the overtime. And last year, as, as you, I don't know, Peter didn't have the microphone near him, but it was $1.2 million. Very good. It answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Council LaPierre. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for joining us uh, along with CFO Karen and Comptroller Spencer. Um, I have uh, just, before we get rolling, I do want to um, acknowledge the good work that you folks have done over the past, uh, let's say, winter into spring, President Sear, Vice President Barton, and uh, working with the mayor diligently on uh, trying to close this uh, budget deficit. I think the communications improved, and I um, want to applaud the three of you for taking a leadership role and spending umpteen hours, because <coughs> ultimately we are the recipients of a lot of time and effort, and uh, I do acknowledge the work that you were doing together uh, to try and close this, what I think was $10 million at one point. Um, and uh, along with that, we had a budget subcommittee formed earlier this year that were really uh, tasked with brainstorming, if you will, and trying to come up with uh, remedies. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think we're getting there, but obviously it's not an envious task to put together 
a budget of this magnitude. You may even admit that it's one of the toughest ones you've been through as mayor. Um, in terms of uh, the net school spending issue, real quick, I know that the obligation, I think, at this point, with the amount of money sent over to the school department, are we avoiding a penalty at this stage on that? I think so, but we have to... Like, what's the percentage? Okay. Uh, right now, the, uh, the school budget uh, is probably somewhere on the order of $1.5 million short. Part of the problem short is... Short of what? Short of meeting our net obligation. The 95 percent The budget control. that's presented before you, keeping in mind that we don't know what our true obligation is until we know what our 17 obligation was, and we don't find that out until October. So the, I think that one of the items that will have to be addressed between uh, uh, now and December will be to determine exactly what we need to spend on the school's budget to make it whole, and that will be part of the, the uh, final uh, decision-making before we set a tax rate. No, no, I, we won't, as I indicated, we don't find out exactly what our 17 obligation was until roughly November. Once we have that, then because, because our obligation for 18 is dependent upon how, we, how closely we met our obligation for 17, and we don't find that out until November. Once we know in November what our obligation is, then we can more precisely budget the remaining money necessary to meet our obligation. And uh, the follow-up to that is I just want to try to get my head around the whole budget process because it's only my second one, but in looking at the overall picture, trying to avoid, I think we had a loss of $700,000 or something in June in the school reimbursement or from Chapter 70. Yeah. Are we, we don't want to go down that road because what we're doing is passing things like a meals tax, for example, which now is a good idea. We, we did that. You vetoed that. We overrode your veto. Now you think it's a good idea to have it and it's in your budget. But we did it for you. Can you say that that is accurate, that we as a council thought the need was there enough to make that vote so that, you know, it helped your budget that you're presenting to us tonight? in terms of the fee as well on the trash, that debate we just had. But That's your trash fee. You're initiating that. We're affirming that. We're trying to help you as a partner, right? Let me answer that. Sure. And I want to say it very clearly and into the microphone, Council up here. We had just asked the people of the city of Lynn to get a $200 debt exclusion increase on their tax bill, and they resoundingly said <coughs> no. This was on the school vote in March. I didn't want to have any new taxes imposed on the general public of the city of Lynn. If you recall when I was talking in my introduction to the trash fee, I said I want to have as little impact on pos as possible on the average single family, single unit resident in the city of Lynn, and I want to keep as many people who are currently employed by the city employed. And to me, the tax, the meals tax, it, it affects anybody, whether they're Linners or non-Linners, whoever eats at a restaurant is, in Lynn is going to be putting more out of their pocket. So as a matter of principle, I didn't want to do that three months after the constituents and the voters told us, no, we don't want a tax. And then the council went and passed a tax. If I was to do it again, I would do it the same way again. Because this $700, I'm not saying, uh, $700,000, I'm not saying it's small potatoes. But I did give you um, things like, uh, for example, the, the ambulance, the privatizing the ambulance would take care of that without taxing the Lynn residents. Um, doing the uh, auditorium, the pot fee, that would take care of all of that. So it was one component, and I appreciate that you did it. I was not going to go along with it on a, as a matter of principle because it was, would be a tax that would affect 
your ordinary letter, and I didn't want to do that. I can respect your position on that, and I can appreciate it, but at the same token, when you talk about a property residential increase of $200 on average versus a few pennies on the dollar where you're going out and having a meal or a drink, where we've already lost almost $700,000 because lack of a payment for net school spending, that concerns me. So we're losing 700, then we're trying to <coughs> regain that by adopting a meals tax about that same amount, and then we go ahead tonight and push forward a trash fee on residents that's gonna be in the <coughs> amount of around two million ballpark. And the issue is with, whether we tax them one time for new schools or we fee them to death forever, the issue is a more global issue, I think, in terms of adopting a vision for the city so we're not coming back here and trying to send out tax bills early. This started last December. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, you know that, where we wanted to, you know, I didn't want to, but P P uh, CFO Karen wanted to send out these tax bills in advance, try and get ahead of, you know, the tsunami which was going to be forecasted. And I think we've done an adequate job. It's just, my fears are we're not really, and I appreciate how little you have to work with, um, but going forward, this council doesn't want to be dealing with things on the eve of a new fiscal year. Here it is, June 27th. We're scrambling, and I know it's months of hard work to get to this point, but we are not in a very good position of strength as a city if we look sort of at the overall picture and trying to put band-aids on things and trying to get through three months and worrying about what December of 17 looks like. So I'd rather look at it as a comprehensive sort of, and I'm sure you do as the mayor, I can only vote to approve this budget. I know I can't add, any, any, add, add to things, I can make cuts, but I just hope when you're talking about the things you talk about like a RFP for health insurance next year, you know, really putting that out to bid. We've had Harvard for several years. We should entertain the blues. Let's see what they can come up with. I hope you're getting creative. I'm, I'm happy that you um, reduced the waste management obligation, you know, by half a million dollars. But we're still sort of at this point, and I hope it gets better, maybe forecasting out, you know, the recommendations that were brought to us, I think, a few months ago from the Philadelphia uh, firm from the state that was a free service that helped us with budgeting and trying to implement, which I think we're trying to do. One of those things was the meals tax. I think the other was the ambulatory, <coughs> what, what did you call Counselor, it? Counselor, can I make a quick comment on yes. that, that study? Yes. Are you aware that that study expects the city of Lynn to hold uh, zero, zero percent wage, pay right. raises, zero percent pay increase through F why 2022 can you tell me truthfully and honestly that you believe that the city of lynn would be able to avoid strikes jlmc arbitration or any other attempts to remedy a zero for a pay raise for the next five fiscal years it depends on who the negotiator is i really doubt that we would be able well, to get anybody to agree to a 0% pay raise over five years. I just- That was one of several recommendations. I mean, well, well, we no, can it, look at one thing, but we're trying to look at the whole package yet it again. It also recommended hiring freeze and laying off 25 to, to 30 people. It's, it, frankly, you want my opinion on that? It wasn't worth the paper it was written on. It was ridiculous, but if you want to quote it, go right ahead. Well, I'm dealing in reality here, and this is what we have to do because we, I just gave you the numbers. 143,983,000 for the schools, 2 million for FICA, 40, almost 41 million for life and health, 8.5 million debt service, 28 million pension, 52 million salaries. That's what we're left with. If there's no other vision or creative way of doing it, and as far as the number of whether we met net school spending, the state likes to surprise us six months into our next fiscal year, and they say, oh, you were bad, you missed it in the last fiscal year. So now make it up with six months to go in this fiscal year. It's extremely frustrating, so we do the best we can do 
but we cannot see the future. And we have to wait for that letter to come from the state with regard to the RFP, by the way, because you covered a lot there. But with regard to the RFP, Dave Hegan, who represents the coalition um, bargaining that goes on for the health care, he sent me a letter asking about certain things that he wanted. One of the things that he wants to see is an RFP for health insurance. I've agreed to that. I see no reason why we shouldn't. That is a good way of looking to reduce costs, and we should have every option available to us. But there, there really is no magic solution as long as we are bound by state formulas, by debt ob obligations, by contract obligations, by pension obligations. I gave you the bottom number, not counting energy contracts, street lights, the senior center, the trash, $28 million. That's all the play we have. And do you have, uh, in, are you budgeting in this budget? I didn't see it anywhere, but I could have missed it. A, either a planning director or a planning department. I know that's been talked about. Yeah, the original planning director. It was not going to be a planning department. It was going to be the planning director. There was no money in the city budget that would have supported the creation of a planning director, which would have ended up benefits and all that, little north of $100,000. However, I got the EDIC and community development to commit $50,000 a piece toward a salary for a planning director. We got some resumes. They weren't great. We've had further discussions um, amongst ourselves and, uh, and with some other community leaders that have been vocal about looking for a, a planning department, such as the Lynn Business Partnership. And they felt as though, uh, in light of the, the lack of credentialed people that were applying, and in, in light of the fact that we weren't going to be able to get it up and running with uh, a full staff, but merely kind of a half-hearted, you know, we can do this, and it would be bad form as long as, con as well as confusing to the residents of Lynn if we're laying off a bunch of people if this trash fee hadn't passed, and yet we're hiring a planning director. The truth is, though, the money for the planning director would have come from dedicated funds that could be used for that hire, and not a penny of that money could have been used to decrease the deficit in the budget. So the short answer is, I guess, no planning director for the immediate future. Just going to kind of wait and see, see how things shake out. And when it does become a reality, I think it is going to have to be as a full-on department and not simply as a person doing some planning. Last question for me. Just explain, because um, we get notifications from all residents across the city on Explain how there's a brownout or what that means at various fire engines or stations that we see. Citizens will come and say, why are we browned out if we have you know, okay. personnel or overtime? The, the, the or, how's that work? The decision to brown out is made by the chief based on the number of men with personnel that he has available for any given shift. Uh, traditionally and by contract, we put three men, three people, I'm sorry, <laughs> My non-sexist brain must have gotten the brunt of this cold, but all right, we'll put three people on a ladder, uh, three people on an engine, and four people on a ladder. So we have six engines. Six times three is 18. Four, uh, three ladders, three times four is 12. 18 plus 12 is 30. You need a district chief. You need uh, the driver. But in any event, we have a minimum manning per shift of 35 people. If that number drops so that someone calls out sick on engine five and there's nobody available to put on to man engine five, um, then they have to do what's called a brownout because you can't safely operate that apparatus with only two people. So that gets taken out of service for the shift. <coughs> if the chief decides that he would rather have some maybe he wants to keep engine five in, plan in service, but he can think that there's a smaller number of runs that are attributable to engine seven. He has the authority to detail somebody off of engine seven and bring them over to engine five. And that way engine five stays in service, but engine seven is browned out. So exactly as to what 
um, <coughs> what engines or what ladders get browned out at any given time. It's a function of the chief using his overtime, using his manpower, and using his authority to de detail people out to other pieces of equipment. And I know that's just sort of a baseline. No, there's I, there's I a lot more that, that goes into it, but that's the general idea of a brownout. It's out. helpful to me. And do you foresee that there will be more of those in FY18? Um, or are we going to cut back on that? Or are they fully it's, funded? Or? It's the chief's decision, but... It's your budget that you work right. with him on. Ultimately, I, it's you. I right? do think that we will be able to keep to the minimum manning. And, and this maybe this is a nice way to tie this up. That's why I'm kind of looking at looking at some of these people who are currently assigned to the day shift because if we can have them on that night shift and if we can have the paramedics who are currently on the ambulance on the, <coughs> the rotating divisions that operate apparatus, then you have less of a need for brownouts because they can get detailed to the place where the person is sick or has a vacation day or whatever and keep that piece of equipment in operation. And I fully realize for any firefighters in the room that I'm making this really simplistic, but I'm just trying to explain what it means to have more than minimum manning on a shift. If you have more than minimum manning, the, uh, the chances of brownout go down, directly, pro directly affected one by the other. So. Yeah, I mean, my concern, you know, some of the headlines recently, I, I point to Holyoke and other communities that have really had tough, tough, like us, they're in dire straits budgetary-wise, but, you know, we don't want to be a tragedy a way of away from, you know, absolute disaster and a fatality. So, and you I, know, I, I think you would agree. And um, I think we're doing, at least this council, you know, speaking for the body, is doing a yeoman's work to try and meet you with the needs of the budget. But again, just forecasting, vision, whatever you want to call it, trying to make sure that in the next year, in the next fiscal year 18, we can keep that dialogue going all year long like it has. Um, I, I can tell you that Councillor Sear and I mean President Sear and Vice President Barton and I will most likely be starting up again in a couple of weeks <laughs> and start looking at some of these other things that, that I've one, talked to you about as possibilities. One thing that I really want to emphasize, I think Councillor Capano <laughs> touched on it earlier too, is this medical <laughs> marijuana. You know, I think July 11th, we have before us a special permit on that. We can't do a special permit until we have a host agreement. So really the onus and the leverage and all of the, it starts with you, and I think we've been very firm on our positions on, you know, what that money should look like, where it should be targeted, and we, we, we approved that Valentine's night. I remember because we had a meeting that night, and it was Valentine's Day, and I was here. So I think from February 14th to now, which is almost July, that's ample time for you to negotiate but you would, you would have tell to, you, know, you would have to take that up with the law department because obviously it's a legal document. The mayor does not sit down in the room and write the paragraphs that are contained in the legal document. Waiting for a legal document on it. The host agreement is a legal document. So uh, Attorney Lamana has been handling it for the city, and <coughs> the um, document was going to be. They were finalizing some of the pieces of it. They were going to pick it up after the budget, the trash fee, and everything else. Is Attorney Lamana still in the room? He is. He's behind. Oh, I can't see him. I would, I would imagine that that is going to be something that will be done within 30 days, given that the trash fee has been done. Uh, it's, it's not reinventing the wheel. Other cities and towns have done it. It'll, it'll be sitting down and, and working with Councilor Capano on some of the uh, details as it affects his ward. And and how quick would the revenue, the new revenues be available for something like that? Like, would it be in fiscal year 18 budget, Mr. Karen or Mayor or that Attorney is Lamont? One, of, one of the bidders has indicated a, a willingness to um, make a, a oh. payment to the city this fiscal year. The other one would be Next more well, this fiscal FY18. year coming up. Well, yeah. July 1 is fiscal year. The other right. is dependent upon uh, any possible legal challenges that may, may come. But uh, I do anticipate at least one of the, the chosen bidders would be making a payment this fiscal year. Okay. And the rest would be dependent upon the lawsuit. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Annette. Um, Madam Mayor, um, it's nice to see you tonight, and I know you have been doing a wonderful job with um, Council uh, President and uh, Vice President. Uh, I um, have a question. Maybe you touched this already, but somehow uh, I just want uh, the public to, uh, to hear it loud. So what's, I mean, how much difference the budget we have uh, FY17 and uh, 18. Uh. 
the FY17 budget <coughs> was 299.690, and this one is 304.731, so the budget has increased by about $5 million, something just over $5 million. So why um, last, um, in, um, through the, in uh, FY17, um, we didn't face layoff in this, I mean, the uh, next fiscal year layoff? <coughs> because we had a lot of retroactive pay increases and new contracts that had to be funded that all came about in FY17. So now we have to fund all of those increases going forward. And I would guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the bulk of the $5 million increase would be attributable to increases in, in salaries. Yes? Or net school spending. Or net school spending. And pension. And pension. But those are three of the factors right there. Okay. And uh, also, um, I'm also always asked about the property that we own, and I know we own a lot of properties. Um, can you uh, perhaps you know, give us an estimation? So if we sell uh, half of properties that we own, so how much uh, we, we would make? How would that? that? That would be Peter. I mean, the two main properties that we've been talking about that I alluded to now, the Eastern Avenue Fire Station and the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. Mm -hmm. One of the um, stipulations that the school committee put on allowing us to advertise the Thurgood Marshall Middle School was that uh, the minimum bid be $4 million. It, it did finally end up being $4 million, right? Okay. I'll fact check it, <laughs> but I think it's $4 million. Okay. So either that one is worth a minimum of $4 million or it doesn't even get sold per the... The, the, oh, Attorney Lamana, were you there? So four million dollars, <laughs> another two million dollars, another two million dollars that uh, would be freed up uh, not demolishing the building. You like it? You like a Jack in the Box? The man <laughs> <brother>. I know. <laughs> um, and the Eastern Ave Fire Station, I don't know what that would be assessed at. Maybe Peter has a guess. <laughs> Uh, I haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't been intimately involved in the uh, public property uh, councils selling these uh, properties. We've had some discussions on some numbers, but I haven't, that hasn't been the focus of my stuff, but I, uh, in the last few months, but I would assume it's assessed at probably uh, 150, 175,000 now. But, keeping in mind that I'm not, I haven't been in that property, I don't know the condition, and you know, it, it's dependent upon what sort of uh, uh, special permit is uh, approved to, to allow it. Obviously, if there's a special permit allowing a more intensive use, that's gonna affect how much that property's worth. So there are too many variables to come up with a specific number. And uh, I know we have more than, we have a lot of properties um, that need to be sold, and. Um, are we working with um, any realtor or this to be? We, um, Attorney Lamana and I, back around April or May, put a, a, together a list of properties that are in tax title and those that looked like they were likely to be eligible for sale through tax title by the city of Lynn. Mm -hmm. And I think there were about 10 or 11 properties on there. Some of them are little strips of land that would only be usable for the uh, butters, really, but I think um, Attorney Lamana might have at least a, a round figure as to how much those were worth. My memory is like something over, a little over a million, but I'm not positive. It's probably with the homes and condos and Attorney Markopoulos has put together RFPs and your public property committee voted this evening mm -hmm. to advertise those. So the homes and condos will be advertised probably in the next two weeks. <coughs> the smaller lots will have to have some contact with the individual uh, ward councilors what uh, restrictions they want on this, if it's landscaping or parking, whether it's buildable or not buildable, but the homes and condos uh, with uh, Attorney Markopoulos putting together the RFP will be advertised uh, before the end of August, I would say, uh, correct? Right. The reason I ask, because uh, I have spoken with some investors and builders, they, they're interested in looking at um, some pieces of land mm -hmm. and um, to invest in our city, and would be an additional uh, uh, money that uh, add to the budget is uh, right that mm -hmm. i believe the sale of that property would be treated much like the sale of marshall middle school and um and the uh, eastern ave fire station and it would only be usable toward bondable items but still it would give us some relief on the budget it's 
No? Except those are foreclosed properties. Uh, first, the proceeds would go on the books to reduce the amount of tax liability that was on the books at the time they were taken, and the balance of the sale would go to uh, the general fund. Oh, good. You can, you can move that along quickly, Attorney Lamona? For the vote of the public property committee this evening, <laughs> okay. uh, that that is. Right. I thought it, I thought it became public property once it it went through tax title. So I'm glad to know it's not. Uh, that no that helps us. That gives, uh, Councilor Nett, that gives us a huge, greater amount of flexibility in how we would use the proceeds from those sales as opposed to Eastern Ave or Thurgood Marshall. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Councilor Capano. Yeah. Um, could you go over the status of the, the home rule petition for the custodians, where, where we are at with that and how uh, that fits into the budget, you know, our assumptions for how much revenue that will be and the effect on the budget going forward, you know? I think the status starts with Attorney Lamana and the revenue um, implications would be the assessor and the CFO. The bill, uh, the home rule petition has been submitted to the legislature. It has been filed. It has been filed, and I, my understanding is $700,000 is a savings anticipated. Uh, the sooner it, it becomes law, hopefully it will become law, uh, the closer we can realize all, the, all, the, all of that financial benefit. Uh, so it, it's at the State House now. I know we're waiting. I know sometimes it takes some time. It just seems like it's been a, a long time. Is, can you give us an update? Is there someone here from the State it House? There was a need for an amendment, so that did slow stuff up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to switch hats. Thank you. Um, so the original home rule petition that was passed was, um, was, uh, had some deficiencies in it that would have made it uh, unpassable. That's why we, if that's even a word, uh, that's why we had to resubmit a newly drafted home rule petition. We had to have a public hearing on it, and we had to have it passed and then signed by the mayor and submitted, and that's what the delay was. But now it's before, uh, it's been filed in the House. Uh, where it'll start its process. Every bill in Massachusetts must have a public hearing. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is uh, uh, not a very timely filed bill, so there are thousands and thousands of bills that have been scheduled for hearings. We are strongly advocating for its quick resolution, but what people should understand is that every home rule petition filed by every city and town is the most important home rule petition to that city and town. So it's the same pressures everywhere. Uh, but we're hopeful, as we talked earlier, that if things move quickly, that we would get something done by uh, by September, knowing that in August there are n there's there's no session. September, the fall, correct. And that would be very fast. We don't work as quickly as the city council. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions by the council? Councilor Cahill. Thank you. Um, just for myself and for the other counselors and, um, and for the folks at home, I just want to get a kind of a picture of, of kind of a large picture of the city's finances, then I just have a couple of specific um, questions. Um, and I think Mr. Karen could probably answer these questions. So we have a, a total budget proposal of $304,731,011. And we have the payroll breakdown, the expenses breakdown. Of that 304, how much of that money is, is either reimbursed by the state, reimbursed by the federal government, or includes uh, grants? Uh, there, there wouldn't be any grants in there. Those, those are on top of whatever is in the budget. And that includes the school department's budget as that well? That includes the school department budget. Okay, so how much of that is reimbursed? How much of that is, is actual City of Lynn well, we're still waiting for conference committee to approve the budget, but uh, approximately 150 million would be Chapter 70 money, and you also have to, uh, you know, the the uh, final numbers for which is a big factor. The final numbers for uh, cherry sheet ch cherry sheet charges still has to be finalized, uh, meaning the big items there are. Uh, uh, out of district tuition that we pay out to other school districts for Lynn kids going to a different school district and the really big item is charter schools and I know there was a big difference between uh, uh, charter school reimbursement between the Senate and the House versions you know there, there's a lot of variables there that uh, have to be finalized but okay, roughly 150 million 
So you should know this answer because we're, out, we're basically out of it. Out of the $299 million budget that we had last fiscal year, yeah. how much of that money was, was reimbursed, came from reimbursements or from funding sources outside of Lynn taxpayers? Uh, I'd, have to def I'd have to defer that to Mr. Spencer. I mean, you're talking about grants, money expended on grants. <coughs> I'm saying that we don't come up with $299 million in the city to pay for this budget. How much? Well, it, I, you know, uh, for, yeah, we came up when we all that stuff when the budget was passed last year. It actually we've come up with a lot more money than that because the cherry sheet charges are not included in the three hundred and four million dollars. The uh, uh, that's the big item, and the overlay account for tax abatements is not included in that budget. There's a lot, a lot of uh, there's approximately the actual expenditure reported on the cherry sheet was close to $327 million, I think, last year, because there are a number of items that are not part of the budget. The, just the cherry sheet charges by themselves are approximately $20 million, on top of whatever's exp expended here. Okay. Um, okay. So, aside from that, that wasn't helpful. Um, let's get to two specifics. One, on page 105, because there isn't, there aren't too many increases here that of note, but on page 105, it looks as though we expend about $276,000 a year on, on life insurance, but we have budgeted $370,000 as we did last year. So I'm just curious if we're scraping for pennies here. Why is no they, they, that situation there is that that line item based on our analysis has been regularly overfunded. So that was something based on the historical payment of life insurance for employees. Uh, are the city's, the city's costs for those life insurance policies. So you anticipate on spending $300,000? What's that? You anticipate paying $300,000? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we, we appropriated an, uh, a significant amount of money out of that line item for FY17 simply because it wasn't needed. So what we did is reduce the line item to what was truly needed for the coming fiscal year. That's not what it says. Oh, it's going the other way? Yeah, yeah. that's so the complete opposite of what your budget says. Right. So this is, uh, we just uh, went out to bid on our insurance. Oh, uh, the, so this is insurance. I thought, I thought he was referring to uh, life insurance. No, page 105. Yeah, life insurance, page 105. This is life insurance. The, the budget amount Yeah, it was reduced. No. No. And it looks historically in 2016 and 2017, it was hovering between 269 and 276. But this year, it's 370. Just it just because it's stuck out. It's not much. There's not there's not too many increases in this budget. So th this is uh, colonial life. Can you it? speak into the microphone? Because the people at home are very curious about. <laughs> Basically, this is uh, just our life insurance portion of um, of our in our in costs. And basically, th that's just a natural increase in, from a budgetary standpoint. So the original in 2016, it looks like the actual was about 270, $270,000. In 2017, the original budget was 370. Uh, revised. No, the, 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 the amount budgeted is the same as last year. Yeah. Uh, the original 17 budget was 370. What was actually spent was 277. Yep. What was actually spent in 16 is 269. Yep. I mean, uh, there's no reason the council couldn't cut that number by uh, $100,000 because we used that money for other purposes last year. So. You sure? Well, I, I don't expect to be adding employees in the coming year. Well, we'll just before we start cutting, I just want to make sure that that is something that we that there's no. We, I just want to make sure yeah. it's legitimate before we do it. I'll second that motion, Mr. Cahill, yeah. if you make that. Well, let's just make sure before yeah. we rush to judgment, let's yeah. make sure. That, that item has been traditionally overfunded. I wasn't aware that we had level funded. Oh, well, I'll make a motion to reduce line item 74069015 by $190,000. Uh, second. Is it arson? There you go, arson. Motion. Motion made by Council Gale, seconded by Council Trahan to amend. Call. Roll call. Council Barton? Yes. Council Cahill? Yes. Yes. Council Capano? Yes. Yes. Council Chacutis? Yes. Yes. Council Colucci? Yes. 
Yes, Council Sear. Yes. Yes, Council Lapia. Yes. Yes, Council Lozier. Yes. Yes, Council Nett. Yes. Yes, Council Trahant. Yes. Yes, Council Walsh. Yes. yes. And I just have a few more questions, and that's the first time in 10 years I was actually <clears throat> able to reduce a line item ever. Wow. Nice job, Council. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so my second question is, I'm comparing the budget we have before us <coughs> for education that says... Council Gale, if I may just say real quick, we can't add anything, amendments or anything, until yeah. after the public hearing. We haven't even done that by yet. Oh, okay, we'll do that again. Um, so the budget I have before me from the city indicates a total for education of $143,982,928. Okay, so I'm looking at just a description. I, 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 we're, we're aware of this issue. A million dollars off, you know? $100,000. No, no, no. No, no, no. This one says 140. The SX Aggie. Aggie. Yes. Okay, so the SX Aggie is also included in this budget and others budget. Yes. That's perfect. And that's, that's reimbursed. What's the transportation reimbursement on that, too, in, from SX Aggie? I know that they... Transportation reimbursement? Yeah, because I, I believe because we're within 30 miles of it, we get like We, we receive money at some point during the fiscal year. Well, if we have kids drop out, I mean, we don't... We, we, this yeah. is not built. Yeah, it is. Um, they do. They we do. Get, we have in the past received the reimbursement for transportation. Yeah, I think actually that. But that money just goes to the general fund. Although tuition has been increased, um, my understanding is that when the merger occurred, that we actually, because of the transportation yeah. reimbursement, we actually saved more money. Yeah. And, and, what, and once again, this this is just an estimated number they provide us. The actual number is based on how many kids either uh, unenroll or uh, either kids that. Fewer kids enroll or more kids enroll, so it's subject to adjustment over the course of the fiscal year. Um, thank you. Uh, so my next question is to the CFO. So we're, we're, in, we're in a little bit of a financial pickle, which we have been for a little while. I'm just curious, as a CFO, when were you, when were you appointed CFO? Um, Mid-13. Okay. What, Calendar year. Give me a, a, your honest Excuse, assessment. Excuse, excuse me, uh, yeah, mid, mid calendar year 13. Okay, give me, I just want your honest assessment as a CFO um, who has tremendous powers under, um, under, under our charter and, and acts of the legislature. Like, what are your thoughts on between 2013 and today, um, our financial health and some of the things you have done to try to avoid where we are today? Well, in terms of uh, the, the financial health, uh, the issue has always been that uh, based on uh, the DESE whole teacher retiree health insurance issue, that there was a tremendous uh, change in, or a tremendous amount of money that was moved from, that needed to be moved from the, assuming the same revenues, needed to be moved from the city side of the budget to the school side of the budget. Uh, the, the mayor has committed to not reduce staffing over that time period, uh, which we have made some savings on the non-personnel side of the budgets. Uh, we have made some, uh, some savings on some positions not being filled. But the, the essentially over those since FY14, we've basically been relying on reserves in order to maintain operations on the city side of the budget at their traditional level, shall we say. At what, and, what's, and, the, and the reason we're in a more dire situation now is we've essentially exhausted those reserves with FY17. So there are no, no longer any reserves uh, in terms, we don't expect to have a positive or substantial free cash number for FY18. So. Uh, the uh, with that lifesaver, shall we say, that's been used in prior years will not be available this year, which means we either have to come up with new additional revenues or there will have to be additional cuts made to the budget in order to balance the budget. And uh, I'm going to get back to that in a moment. So what are, have you offered any solutions? What are some of the solutions that you have offered as CFO since 2013? for the city to be uh, on a healthy financial track? 
I've mentioned the meals tax on multiple occasions, but uh, it was not re warmly received. Uh, I've, I've suggested that uh, further reductions in the budget would have to be made, you know, which essentially, you know, because of the uh, heavy personnel percentage that's part of the budget would have to would involve the reduction of personnel. Any Those other suggestions? Two main items. And, I, and other, I, I, for example, I've, I've recommended looking at the ambulance service. I've made a number of suggestions over the years. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I'm neither the chief executive officer nor, I'm the, uh, nor am I the appropriate authority. I don't set policy. I, make, I can make recommendations and I can offer my suggestions and input on what particular policies may be recommended or what the negative drawbacks are of particular policies that are recommended, but ultimately it's the elected officials that have to make the policy decisions to run the city. And I'm under the impression for the charter though that the CFO has tremendous amount of the only the only the only real extraordinary power I have is that I can put people on allotments on their personnel budgets uh, if there's a if there's a concern that a particular department head uh, may, may expend, overexpend his personnel budget before the end of the fiscal year, and I can put him on 112 allotments. I can't make that decision until August 1st, and once on August 1st, I can request that the, the, the particular department head make a recommendation uh, or give me a schedule that he would spend his budget over the next uh, 11 months and then if he exceeds his projections over those 11 months so that he would end up overexpending his budget, I then have the authority to inform the mayor and the council of that fact, and then the mayor has the authority under the charter to override uh, that recommendations or allow the overspending to occur for that particular month. Okay, my, one of my, my last couple questions. Um, so this budget, FY18, we've talked about that the meals, the meals fee has been included in that, $775,000. Excuse me? We've talked about um, the revenues that we are going to be relying on, anticipated yes. revenues we're relying on for FY18 include the meals fee for $775,000, right? Seven, seven hundred. Seven hundred grand. Uh, a trash fee for nearly two million? Approximately two million, yes. And... Um, you didn't expect much for free cash, but is, are any anticipated free cash monies anticipated in this budget? And if so, how much? None. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, it would be, I think it would be fiscally reckless at this point in time to assume that we would have free cash available to fund this budget. And we've done that before, though, haven't we? We've relied on... on we on have relied on free cash. I would say for the last several budgets, we've been a pro on average about four million dollars out of balance from what the council approved and what the uh, revenues were going to generate so that we've used reserves for the last several years, like say the last three years, maybe four, uh, to supplement uh, the revenues with free cash in order to uh, uh, produce a balanced budget for the purposes of uh, submitting the recap and sending out the tax bills. So I'm just going to, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just kind of spitballing here. So it sounds as though in the past we've relied on free cash. This year we're not going to rely on free cash, but instead we're going to supplement that loss of relying on free cash with fees. Well, it, it has to be some sort of revenue uh, savings or, or passing some cost onto the school department and that school spending. Though, I mean, short of making cuts to... Uh, you know, the, the proposed budget. But what makes this a particularly difficult, difficult budget is that you're not using, say, $4 million worth of anticipated revenues as you have in the past. You know, speaking, uh, to, to be fiscally prudent, uh, uh, the, uh, the use of free cash, which is basically one-time revenue source to fund ongoing operations is not advisable. 
and that's the situation we've been in in order to maintain our current level of public safety and other operational cost. And this is the first year we're not doing that? This is the first year. I don't think that, I, I don't think it's a question of not doing it. I think it's just that it's not an option this year. Okay. It would be fiscally imprudent to uh, anticipate that we would be able to go that route. I'm going to yield to any other council that have more questions. I'm sorry. Take up so much time. That. Mr. President, thank you. Um, Mr. Karen, uh, how much we have in our reserve account right now? In our reserve. We have, uh, uh, we basically have, uh, oh, in the reserve account in the budget, there's a million dollars. A million dollars. Okay. We have, uh, in terms of general reserves, we have, uh, we have a negligible amount at this point in time. I see. Um, Madam Mayor, this question to you. Why should we, um, tell us, why should we um, vote on this, um, your, your uh, budget? So give us the reason why. Why you should approve it? Yeah. Why should because it, reta it retains all of our employees. It, it estimates conservatively um, when we are anticipating revenues, so we think that our numbers are pretty solid. And it presents a little bit more of a worst case scenario when it comes to our expenses. So we're anticipating that those are going to be um, lower. This budget has been worked on for countless hours by the CFO, the comptroller, the city attorney, the council vice president, the council president, and myself sitting for many hours in each meeting with many meetings per month, um, and they have all, uh, all of the expenses have come as a result of consensus among all of those people at the table looking at a way to retain our city services and to retain our current personnel while staying within the confines of what we can do for revenue raising. Um, you've heard of Prop two and a half. It means that Peter is constrained. He can't just decide to increase taxes by 4% next year to, to help us to meet the needs of, of, of the city's running in, you know, as, as we would want. He is constrained by only raising taxes to that levy limit, to that yearly limit. And um, this will allow us to do that. And uh, I think it's a very fair document, I don't see any place else <coughs> where we could cut on the expense side. And I, I certainly don't want to cut anybody on the, the employee side. And I think that Vice President Barton and President Sear would agree that this is the best combination of revenue and expenses that will allow us to keep city services and not have to uh, lay people off and not have to be um, depending on manufactured numbers to make the budget fit. It's a really realistic budget. Right. I oh, read, I read oh, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I read through it, but I see that you, you cut a lot on the expenditure side. I see. I appreciate that. It's very well prepared. Uh, and if, okay, if this doesn't approve tonight, what will happen? Um, there's, there is actually a statutory formula for what, what would happen, and I believe it, oh, actually, oh. Uh, Attorney Lamarra. Uh, Attorney what, Lamarra what's the question? <laughs> if the budget doesn't check in the box. <laughs> Want me to answer it? You have some options, except reduce and reject uh, the budget. It, if, if, the, if the council, uh, w one option is the council re does not act on the budget by function of general laws, it, be, it goes into effect. You, if you reject the budget, then this, the mayor would have to submit a new budget. It would probably be a two, pro I would suspect that two budgets would be submitted. The mayor would have to submit an alternative budget, which would, we would go through the whole budget process hearing, uh, uh, et cetera. And she would also likely submit a 1 12th budget uh, that would fund necessary oper op uh, operations through uh, July 31st. For example, there wouldn't be any snow and ice money included in that budget. It's not going to snow in July. Uh, 
It probably would include more overtime than just taking 12 per, 12, one twelfth of the overtime money, say, in the fire or police budget, because this is the time of year that most of the vacations are taken for police and firemen because the summer, so we would have to include a bigger chunk of the overtime budget. We would probably consult with the chief and determine uh, what his uh, estimate of overtime need would be for September. Uh, we would probably uh, fund the school budget. In that case, maybe one twelfth, although the, their expenses are much lower because a lot of the teachers don't get paid in the summer. But they still need money in order to start ordering their uh, uh, books and uh, other expenses, non-personnel expenses. So uh, typically, I would suggest that we at least allocate one twelfth of the uh, uh, school budget to the school department so that they could start the procurement procedures that they need to do. But uh, that, that's, that's what would happen. You know, so you would have you, more than likely, in order for people, because if, if, if we don't have at the minimum uh, a one month budget passed at the next meeting, mm -hmm. we would probably have to shut down the city other than essential services. So I would suggest that we, the mayor would come up with a 112 budget that you know, the council would uh, probably pass because it would meet all our obligations to July 30, 31st and then debate the full year's budget uh, as newly presented by the mayor. Thank you so much. Operationally, it would be a disaster from an accounting perspective in relation to outstanding uh, our obligations and when bills are due. And if you go on a 112th, a lot of our uh, obligations will not be met in a timely fashion. Thank you. Councilor Annette. Thank you. Councilor Trott. And thank you, Council President. Um, so it seems like over the past month, um, Madam Mayor, we've um, you know we voted for the meals tax. Tonight we voted for the uh, the rubbish fee. So that's kind of going to hold us at bay for for layoffs right now. Now, what do you encounter from now until December? How much money do you? Uh, actually, a question to all of you: How much money now do we have to cut or raise again in the next five or six months so we don't have to be sitting here in December worrying about laying people off? We're looking, again, it's an estimate of about $2 million. Um, the way we track that is to look at the revenues that are coming in, if they're higher or lower than expected. We look at items like overtime, are they on pace to be higher or lower than expected? We look at health insurance claims. Health insurance claims are a really tricky thing because the way it works under net school spending, this is kind of crazy, if our health insurance claims come in over what we would anticipate, our net school spending number is actually going to go lower. And if they come in under what we anticipate, we might be saving money on the city side, but that money is going to have to go over to the school department to make up for the deficit in net school spending. So there are a number of different things that will be um, looked at and, and covered on real-time basis. For example, this trash fee. We have only round numbers and estimates of how much it will generate. Once the DPW commissioner actually sets the rates and the, and the collections start, then we're going to be able to see or get at least a, a, a good handle on what the anticipated quarterly or monthly or semi-yearly amount is going to be. But it's something that for now all we can do is project. And as I has said to Councilor Nett, we're kind of projecting a little low on the revenue and a little high on the expense so that we'll be hopefully pleasantly surprised in both directions and come to the middle with a much narrower number than the $2 million. And did you want everyone to answer that? Oh, no, no, I just said whoever, whoever wanted to answer it. Oh. Now, who is going um, to, another question to all of you, who is going to sit down with the, um, the commissioner of the DPW and set the fee? That would be the CFO. Okay. It, well, he's going to give advice on setting it. He, okay. The, according, as I recall that the uh, language of the ordinance, I don't believe you have any authority any authority to direct a fee. You can only give him analyses. Go ahead and you answer. No, no I, I mean, my, 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 my 
uh, our responsibility would be to, based on how many, uh, what the proposed fee is and how many units would be eligible to be do to, to give him an estimate of how much revenue it's going to generate. Uh, I mean, ultimately, it's his decision on what fees. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, don't we discuss in the trash fee, there's sort of an upper limit on the tra residential trash fee of maybe about $220 per unit, simply because that represents the average uh, uh, cost of the city currently under the contract. You really can't be asking people to pay more than what it costs to provide the service in order to, uh, you know, uh, subsidize the people that I'm paying. Right. So what are you looking at for a fee right now? Like what, roughly, what do you think, you know, Tonight, well, like, the, the two, like tonight, the, we we voted for the two million dollars. The two million. What's that the, rate? The, the two million dollar fee is based on numbers that were discussed earlier. That would be roughly two hundred and twenty dollars per unit for out of uh, out of town landlords for their rental units, and about one hundred and fifty dollars per year for the owner rock. I mean, the Lynn resident rental units. Okay, so that that's where we're at that right now. Generate, that would generate. And with those numbers, that's going to generate $2 million. That, that's roughly $2 million. Now, keeping in mind that, that uh, we, don't, we didn't want to go in to uh, expend a lot of energy going into making final determinations in terms of head counts uh, if this thing wasn't going to pass. I mean, it would have been a lot of wasted energy doing that. But I think, you know, they, there's two key uh, sources. There's the tax roll information which will obviously identify the owners and then probably more than likely the proper thing would be to cross-reference that with the census records to show where the people are living and who's living in what units so we can make a determination. From so that. do you think, so you really don't have a, so you don't know, so you, so you don't know if you're going to be pleasantly surprised and it's going to be 2.3 well, million or you don't know if it's going to be 1.7. Well, really well don't what we did is we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, comparing the mailing addresses for the tax bills with the property address to see to make a determination of which units were owner occupied. Obviously, if there was a three-family house, we assumed that that was two units that would be subject to the excise. After we did that analysis and came up with it, uh, it we came up with about uh, just under 1.9 million dollars or 1.85 million dollars. Now that did not factor in looking at the nonprofits and the uh, we only look at residential property. So in addition to that, there would be the nonprofit, both residential nonprofits and business type nonprofits, as well as the business accounts also. So we didn't factor that in. So when you add those accounts, we're estimating it's going to be about two million dollars. Okay. So now I get. That. I just got, I got a few more questions. So, now what can we do right now going forward so we're not waiting to the, you know, the last minute? I heard you talk about like, like privatizing the ambulance. Is that something like, is there a certain time of the year, like right now, where that can, we can start to no, like negotiate that or can you do that any time or like how does that, to anybody, well, I think, how does I think, that work? Uh, I think I'll, you know, I can defer, <laughs> I mean, I can answer for the mayor, but I think, I think there's the issue of the uh, uh, minimum manning issue that sort of affects, until we resolve that, it'll be hard to. In a nutshell, a lot, of the, um, ish, the, a lot of the ideas that I have are going to have to be impact bargained. So we would have to set up a time to sit down with the labor attorney and, and with the various union representatives to see um, whether it would be feasible, what kind of compensation or adjustment to language or or um, other concession would be appropriate in exchange for the granting of um, making this change to help out the city but that can really be done any at any time and it's just a question of um, the pace of the negotiations determining when and if that that idea can be implemented I just think, you know, I just I see other people here tonight that were here earlier, and I just think 
it scares families, it scares people, you hear layoffs, and then it's the, they're going to start living month to month, like we saved them now in July, and now for the next six months, police and DPW and City Hall people got to worry about, well, what's going to happen this summer now? My job going to be on the chopping block? So, I mean, I, I don't know if maybe we should start working on this stuff now. I know you've been working closely with, you know, President's, Council President Sear and Barton and everybody else here, Mr. Karen and Mr. Spencer. But I, I just think we should start picking some of these line items now, not waiting to see what the budget is. I know, and I, and I appreciate everything. I, I still all that, it. you know, that, that you've been doing. And I just like to thank you tonight because I, uh, you know, know you're not feeling well, and I know we're, we've been here a long time, but it's very important. And I'm just, I'm really concerned about the, you know, I just like to start doing these cuts now, be like be proactive, I guess. And I'm, I'm sure you guys are, but I think we really, like, this is kind of last minute to me. I think we, we would kind of put a lot of people's mind at ease, and you guys, and us, if, we kind of knew, well, we're going to have maybe 600000 here. Let's negotiate the health insurance. That contract's huge numbers. I mean, you know, you, you did a great job with the rubbish, took 500 off. Maybe we could do that with health insurance. I mean, I, I know you guys are thinking about everything. I know you know much more than, than I'm thinking about. But I just like to be proactive about it. I just think that we maybe, you know, not tomorrow morning, but, like, get going on it. I know Councilor Sear has been down here on Saturdays. I know you have. I know every, you know. Everybody's brainstorming, and I just, I just don't want to pe let people, I mean, we all know how it feels. You don't, want pe you don't want people out of work. I mean, you don't want them to be worrying about, you know, losing their job. Let's let them focus on what their job is here at the city, and they do a wonderful job. So if, uh, that, that would, that's my peace of mind that I'd just like to say. I just, I, if we I, can be proactive and find some surprise money, I just think we'll be fine, that, you know, in the next four or five months. It'll be I, good. I can assure you, Councillor Trahan, that I would not have sent this budget up to the City Council unless I thought realistically that we would be able to live within its covers from July 1st till June 30th of 2018. So well, no, that's I, I know, I just say, I just like yep, to, I, I just I, see us, you know, we're just, we're in dire straits like everybody said tonight, just like really like to but I think tighten this, our belt and This is the blueprint for allowing us to get through, the, I think right. this is the darkest year, I really do to get through this dark year and then to start to um, add on as some of these other par parts of money come, become freed up. And I can also tell you, I mean, unless, unless they reject me, but um, President Sear and Vice President Barton, we have our Tuesday evening 4 p.m. meetings that we've had and once the budget was kind of put to bed, we stopped having them but there's no reason why we can't resume them. And it's just been, aside from the budget process, it's just given us a chance to talk about issues that I might be facing or the council might be taking up. And it has, it, that part of it has become very informal, but it's a, just been a fantastic way to, to kind of keep, keep note of each other's business lives and understanding what's going on on, on the other side. And I, for one, have found it a pleasure to have those meetings. And I know I owe them pizza because we had pizza once and then I got too cheap and didn't order anymore. So I will promise you pizza at our next meeting, okay? <laughs> but we, we worked Thank really you, hard. Thank you, Council Capato. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to uh, repeat a lot of what was been said. I wa wanted to say I had the same concerns as Councilor Trahant. I just think that uh, one of the good things is, that's come up uh, over this is the amount of dialogue we've had over the budget, probably the most since I've been on the council. And, you know, there are a number of, uh, I guess you could call them opportunities, things that might come up that might help uh, the budget for next year. So one of the ways we should probably keep this going is to have these budget committee meetings so we can have these updates, you know, when you have uh, your meetings with, with the council president and council Barton, and then we can also add input that way. That seems to have worked, you know, and you know probably by default, you know, but somehow it it seems to be a good uh, a good way to do this. And even though the budget, uh, you know, the budget, uh, you know, assuming this budget passes tonight, um, is probably something that I, you know, at least I would suggest that we continue to do it this way going forward, especially where there's, there's still some uncertainty, you know, for the rest of the year. 
Councilor Colucci. I've got one question. Why isn't it in front of you folks instead of Andy Hall sitting there crash fee? Why is he doing it instead of one of you folks? There were a lot of various discussions on the details of the trash fee ordinance and who would bear responsibility for setting rates and what the rates might be and what kind of exemptions there might be. <coughs> and ultimately, the decision was to put the ordinance in final form so that the um, D Department of Public Works Commissioner had the discretion to, pe to set the fee because he was the one most closely associated with the actual cost of trash pickup and the variations on uh, tipping fees and uh, all of the other um, factors that would go into setting an appropriate fee. Uh, furthermore, there's already been precedent set in having the appropriate department head set the fees because we have um, Michael Donovan as head of the Inspectional Services Department setting all of the building permit fees. So we just thought, I mean, it, it ultimately it was up to the counselors to determine in what form they wanted to present the proposed ordinance, but we all were in agreement that, that the language that was presented to you tonight was something that all of us could live with. Council Cahill. Thank you. I, I was just, uh, uh, to follow up on Council Colucci's point, because that did, that was, I think, a sticking point for some counselors. I guess the difference is the trash fee impacts everybody. Not everyone pulls billing permits. Not everyone gets death certificates. Not everyone gets birth certificates. This impacts basically everybody in the city of Lynn, one way or the other, um, whether you're exempt or not. And I guess my question is, you know, if Andy Hall decides to, to set the fee at a dollar, our budget is blown, um, or he sets it at $500 and people freak out. But elected officials are held to the people's will every two years. Andy Hall is not. So I would say just going forward, and I know time was of the essence, I would support changing the person who is ultimately responsible for a trash fee to somebody who was elected because um, the people deserve a recourse on that. And that's just my, my thought on that. And that was one of the uh, items that was considered in the ordinance. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of discussion about that. <coughs> and it's a, you know, a very valid point that you make, Councilor Cahill. Councilor Tryon. Uh, thank you. Uh, bottom line, really, it doesn't, I mean, if we're gonna raise $2 million tomorrow, if we, if we approve this tonight, you guys are gonna <coughs> go to the, you're going to add up all the units, and you're going to divide it by $2 million, and that's basically what, it, what the rate's going to be anyway, right? I mean, that's basically what, what, what Andy Hall's going to have to do, right? Isn't that the bottom line? We, we need $2 million, so, I mean, it's not really, doesn't really need to be a ma made-up number, right? With the, with the three categories of types of units that have right. to be divided up, but essentially... Right, I mean, it's a lot of work for you guys to uh, divide all that, but I'm saying once you do divide it, and you, you're going to just use $2 million as you figure, uh, it's going to kind of set its own rate, isn't it? No, well, uh, let me just say that the $2 million, we didn't start from $2 million and came up with numbers to make it work. What we did is we talked about specific uh, concepts as to how to allocate it. The $2 million number only came up as, as a result of the mayor and the council president discussed this uh, intensely and, you know, just offered some suggestions as to what the fees might be. And based on those fees, we, I, we then did the analysis down in the assessor's office to determine how many units would be likely affected. And then it came out to $1.9 million. Came out to okay, in other words, the, the numbers I gave you earlier on per unit we didn't know how much money that would generate until we actually did the work. And it just happened to come out to two million. So what's it could the have easily come out to 2.3, right. and we would be saying the trash fee is going to generate 2.3. 2.3 million. Yeah. So now what's the average, I think you said it earlier, the average, what do we have, 27,000 households? So what's the average cost? What's it, $6 million a year? We pay $220 per So it's $220 per, per household, roughly. Yeah. So, so that's sort of where we felt that's that your on parameter. the residential that's where you units, started, right. we, we didn't want to go above that. Right. 
right. because we didn't want, you know, that's, that's the, that was the cost per that. unit of providing the service. Right. So that we saw, we sort of held that as a uh, maximum amount. Okay. That's all about. Yes, Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion to call for the vote. Proof. Approve. Approve the vote for the budget. Second. We can't. We, we can't. We have to have the public hearing. We haven't had the public hearing yet. We have to open up the public hearing. So is there a motion to call for the public hearing? Yeah, I'll make a motion. How's that, huh? <laughs> All right. The public hearing to approve the budget or not approve it is now open. All those wishing to speak in favor of the budget, please approach the podium. Judy Kennedy, 23 Buchanan Circle. For all of the reasons enumerated in the last two hours, I would uh, urge the council to approve the budget as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Anyone else seeing none? That part of the hearing is closed. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. What's the wish of the council? Motion to approve. Second. And then I'll done. Motion made by Councillor Cahill, seconded by Councillor Trahant. Discussion. Thank you, Thank you uh, uh, count, uh, Mr. President. I make a motion to reduce the life insurance line item by $90,000. Yes, that amendment. Second. Motion made to slash the life insurance line item by $90,000 $90, on page 105. $90,000. Motion made, Second. seconded by Councilor Losey. Okay. Quick, quick question, but maybe stupid question. I don't know. So, where's the $90,000 going? Now we cut it. Where's it go? The general fund the so just going to cut the bottom okay okay thank you okay so discussion roll call on the motion the motion to cut the 90,000 from life insurance uh, council Barton absent council Cahill yes yes council Capano yes yes council Chikudis yes Yes, Councilor Colucci? Yes. Yes, Councilor Sear? Yes. Yes, Councilor Lapierre? Yes. Yes, Councilor Losey? Yes. Yes, Councilor Nett? Yes. Yes, Councilor Trahant? Yes. Yes, Councilor Walsh? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Discussion on the motion to accept the budget. Roll call. Council Barton? Yes. Yes. Council Cahill? Yes. Yes. Council Capano? Yes. Yes. Council Chikudis? Yes. Yes. Council Colucci? Yes. Yes. Council Sear? Yes. Yes. Council Lapierre? Yes. Yes. Council Losey? Yes. Yes. Council Nett? Yes. Yes. Council Trahant? Yes. Yes. Council Walsh? Yes. Yes. Budget passes. Before we uh, close, motion uh, made is, is there any new business? I got one. Motion to adjourn. Second. Hold it, hold it. Oh, no, we got. No. <laughs> we got committees. We got to do the. You're all set. You can go. Oh, we're not done with Peter Carey. We have to do committee reports, and then I have a quick announcement to make. <laughs> Councilor Annette, Talk report fast. on public properties. Um, <clears throat> First item for the table to the next meeting. Motion was made to table to the next meeting. That's right. And the second. Uh, second it. All those in favor? Aye. Ways and means, Councilor oh, no, Trahan. I'm sorry. There's Anyone? one more motion for public property. Council Nett. Um, second motion second on the public property. You know, it's been voted by the committee. It was approved. Except. Second. Motion to place out to bid all city-owned property with the houses on them. Second. Second. Now, do we need an emergency? I didn't, do we need an emergency? I don't know. Um, oh, no, okay. there's no emergency. No emergency. Okay. Okay. So the minutes have been accepted. Yeah, All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Ways and means, Councilor Trahan. Unanimous vote of the committee, Mr. President. Motion to accept. Second. Motion made, seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion for an emergency on everything. Emergency. Yep, I have to read them. Yep. Okay. Uh, transfer the sum of $115 from the account of reserve to the account of city council expense. Transfer $3,385.10 from the reserve to the city council expense. Transfer the sum of $1,157.65 from the city council expense to unpaid bills of prior year council. Transfer the sum of $1,296.10 from the council expense to the council payroll. Transfer the amount of $1,250 from the Lynn Fire Department expense to the unpaid bills of prior year LFD. Transfer the sum of $70.84 from state elections expense to the city clerk expense. Transfer the amount of $5,803 from the care of dogs to the care of dogs. Is that it? Yep. Uh, Motion made. Seconded. All those in favor? I have to call Aye. the roll call on the emergency. And a roll call on the emergency. Motion made on the emergency. Seconded. Roll call on the emergency. Council Barton? Yes. Yes. Council Cahill? Yeah. Yes. Council Capano? Yeah. Yes. Council Chikudis? Yes. Council Colucci? Yes. Yes. Council Sear? Yes. Yes. Council Lapierre? Yes. Yes. Council Losey? Yes. Yes. Council Nett? Yes. Yes. Council Trahant? Yes. Yes. Council Walsh? Yes. Yes. Uh, there was a meeting of the Committee of the Whole. Nothing happened. <laughs> so that's my motion. Nothing happened. Is it seconded? Second. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That part's done. Um, everybody knows Fourth of July is coming, America's birthday. So we have the fireworks on Linshore Drive Monday night, which is a pretty huge event. But we also have an event that's been taking place uh, up on High Rock Tower that um, Judy jo Wendy Josephs and Calvin have been involved in. It's a pretty big event. It's a spectacular place to watch the fireworks. They have food vendors up there. It starts at 6 o'clock at night. And uh, they also have some speeches, a uh, speech that's, I can't even see it here, Frederick Douglass speech that they all take turns reading. So um, it's a pretty good time. So if you want to go, it's free, bring a picnic lunch. They have food vendors up there. And they have a portable sink now, too. So, <laughs> What's the wish of the uh, council? All those in favor? Aye, aye, aye.